Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry and clicking on the thumbnail for this Master Carpenter's Tool Tote Masterclass Build video. And no, your eyes aren't deceiving you. The timestamp in the quarter of this video really is over three and a half hours, not three and a half minutes. So if you're expecting a flashy TikTok video, do us both a favor and just leave now before your head explodes. <laughs> I'm well aware that this video is a woodworker's marathon, not a YouTube DIY sprint meant for the masses. So I didn't break it up into six episodes, bloated with a bunch of hype and advertising. For those of you who watch to learn, instead of expecting to be taught, you'll find an extensive chapter list in the video description below to help you navigate the entire build process from start to finish at your own pace. You'll learn throughout the video why it took over 10 months to build these three custom tool totes from walnut, maple, and carry wood, and produce this video from over 400 individual video clips. My sincere hope is that every viewer will take away something from this video that makes their time spent watching it well worth their while. And because the journey of a thousand miles begins with just a single step, let's get started. The first step in the build is to simply cut a piece of quarter inch material exactly 12 inches wide and about 16 inches long that will make the pattern for the end of the tool tote. I'm using MDF faced with white melamine, but any flat smooth sheet goods like plywood will work fine. It's important that this piece is an accurate rectangle, so double check the corners to make sure they're square. Next, I'll create a rectangular hole for the handle mortise near the top of this template piece. In an effort to make it easy on myself, because nobody else is going to do it for me, I'm going to approach making this mortise hole in an unconventional manner. And the fabrication sequence is important here, so follow closely. First, draw accurate marks at 14 inches, 12 and a half inches, and 10 and a half inches up from the bottom of the template piece. Then add reference marks 5 and 3 eighths inches in from each edge of the template piece. Then set your rip fence to exactly 5 and 5 eighths inches and make two cuts down to your 10 and a half inch mark. Now score the thin center strip with a sharp knife and snap it out. And don't worry about the ragged end in this slot because as you'll see in a few minutes, it doesn't matter. These steps will leave a slot exactly 3 quarters of an inch wide. So mark and cut a strap of template material about 4 inches long with a snug fit in the slot. If anything, err on the wide side when you're cutting this strip because it's easy to cut another skosh off for a good fit than it is to add a skosh on if the initial width is a sloppy fit. Full disclosure, it did take me two tries to get a fit this perfect, but the fit is exactly what I'm after. Now I can cut a piece about an inch and a half long off one end, and just so you know, it doesn't matter which end. Now I grab my handy Starbond CA Glue Caddy and spritz both sides of the slot and both sides of the strips with Starbond Accelerator and put the two three quarter inch strips down into the slot, aligning them with the layout marks made earlier. Next, I simply apply Starbond's water thin CA glue on the surface and let it wick into the accelerated joint to hold these pieces firmly in place. How cool is that? A little spritz of accelerator cures excess glue on the surface. And after a few seconds of curing time, I can pop the template piece loose and scrape away any excess CA glue from the surface for a nice smooth template. Then I repeat the application and wicking process on the back side of the piece and scrape away excess CA just to make sure these pieces are held firmly in place for the duration. What I'm left with after that process and that sequence is a perfectly rectangular mortise, inch and a half tall, three quarters of an inch wide, that's perfectly centered up in this template piece at the exact distance from the bottom of the tool tote to the location for the handle tenon. And I think you'll agree it's a whole lot easier going through those simple steps than to drill some holes and go about making this square opening with chisels and files. Now that the handle mortise is complete, it's back to the sequence thing to lay out points for arcs that define the unique, elegant shape for the tool tote ends. To minimize frustration during these next layout steps, I start by adding a couple pieces of double stick spec tape to the back of the pattern so it doesn't slide around while I'm making crucial marks on the other side of the template. And spec tape's pretty amazing stuff, so a little bit goes a long way. Note that when I stick the template down, I make sure both edges project past the edges of my work surface, so squares slide uninterrupted along the edges of the template. To start this stage of the layout, I set my square to exactly 6 inches and draw a center line top to bottom on the template. Then I cross that center line with a mark 14 and a quarter inches up from the bottom. 
After that, I set my compass to an inch and three quarters and placed the center point where those lines intersect and put small marks on either side of the center. To locate the apex of the shoulders on either side of the toolbox, put a mark six and seven eighths inches up and another up an inch and an eighth from that along each edge of the template. Then add a mark a half inch in from each edge of the template on that upper mark. To locate tangent points where arcs for sweeping side curves meet, first draw a line eight and a quarter inches up from the bottom of the template. Next, set a compass to two and a quarter inches, place it at the intersecting lines, and again, draw small arcs on either side of the center line. The beauty of making and using a template like this is that you only have to do all these layout steps once, regardless of how many toolbox ends you'll end up making. And now, for the fun part. I use four arcs of different radii to create the shape for the tool tote ends. They're five inches, two and seven sixteenths inches, two and five sixteenths inches, and one and nine sixteenths inches. So I use a compass to draw them out on thin white cardboard. Specifically, a piece of the box from a delicious Marie Calendar chocolate silk pie, and then carefully cut out the arcs with scissors. Nom nom nom. And FYI, this final slice is the piece of pie I'm getting. Before I draw the arcs, I'll make one last reference mark by setting the square to 15 inches and putting a small mark on the top at the center to reference the overall height of the handle. Now I'll start by aligning the 2 and 7 16 inch radius arc with the two points for the top of the end and trace it carefully with a sharp writer pencil. Simple as that. And notice that this arc passes neatly through the 15 inch height mark for the end of the toolbox. And the end result is that the bulge on the arc for the top of the handle is exactly three quarters of an inch, just like on the drawing. Next, I'll trace around the crust on the smallest piece of pie to establish the arcs on the shoulders on each side of the end. With that done, I can use the five inch arc and the two and five sixteenths inch arc to draw the sweeping sides of the tool tote end by aligning them with points on the top of the handle and the tops of the shoulders and connecting the lines at the tangent points. And as an OCD double check, I set my square to the bottom of the bottom arc and draw a line across just to double check that everything lines up. And I like what I'm seeing there. FYI, I established a tangent point for these two arcs at a point eight and a quarter inches up from the bottom and two and a quarter inches out from the center by modeling the tool tote in detail using SketchUp Make. This process allows viewers to recreate the shape even though I generally just freehand curves like this and eyeball them to pleasing proportions. Now that everything's laid out, it's time to pop the template loose and cut the profile. I'll use my band saw for this, but you can sure use a coping saw, a jigsaw, or a scroll saw to get the job done. While cutting a template from a pattern like this, I make sure to cut proud of the layout lines. The closer I cut to the line, the easier it is to finish shaping the template, as long as I'm careful not to cut into or through the line. My goal is to leave just a whisker of white between the cut and the pencil line, and that way, when the whisker of white disappears, I know I've achieved the shape that I'm after. With that done, it's time to tackle the template with sandpaper to fare the curves sweet and smooth. I choose to use a selection of sanding blocks to fare the curves, but you might prefer a spindle sander if you have one. Keep in mind, though, that your toolbox will only look as good as your template, so feel the curves with your fingers as you go along and eliminate any bumps, dips, or ripples from the curves. Unless maybe you're doing a Ruffles potato chip design thing, and in that case, the more ripples, the better. Something to ponder at this point is in these days of ready access to CNC machines, a key takeaway from this process is that you can create unique, dare I say artistic, shapes and designs for your projects using simple hands-on techniques and basic tools without sophisticated equipment doing it for you. And most Next Level Carpentry viewers know how much I hate sanding, but even at that, this really isn't that bad. Mostly because I'm touting this as a master carpenter's toolbox, I'm going to double check my template work. And I do that by simply tracing the template on top of another scrap of white melamine using a sharp writer pencil. And then I flip the template face for face and trace it around it again to compare the two sides for symmetricity, even if that's not a word. And the fact that I end up with a line that's basically just a double thickness tells me that I got this 100% and it's worthy of a master carpenter's stamp of approval. Pachow! And I gotta call out the YouTube trolls here. If you're tempted to post a comment that says something like, 
Oh, I could make ends for 10 toolboxes in the time you spend faffing about making just one template. And you know who you are, right? Because you're the only ones that use the term faffing when you post a comment on a YouTube video. It'll probably come as a surprise to hear that you're the only one you're fooling because most viewers see this in-depth template making process as a next level skill that they'll adapt and extrapolate for use in all manner of applications throughout a lifetime of rewarding woodworking projects. So there, and with that little rant aside, it's time to put this template to work and shape ends for a master carpenter's tool tote. And besides that, I've got a hard earned degree from MIT so I can tell you exactly what to do next. And that is, to take a piece of half inch Russian birch plywood and cut two pieces exactly 12 inches wide and about 16 inches long, just like I did for the template, for a pair of ends for each tool tote I'm making. In this case, I'll cut six ends so I can make three matching master carpenter totes. Note that I aren't the grain to the long dimension of the pieces, so my finished tool tote looks professional even though no strength is gained. It's essential that the bottoms of each of these ends is perfectly square. So after cutting them to rough size, I double check them for squareness with an accurate framing square and then use the joiner for any trimming necessary to make one corner square before ripping them to final width at exactly 12 inches. As seen in other videos on next level carpentry, to square up a piece on a joiner, I merely set the depth of cut to the amount I need to trim off to make the piece perfectly square. Then by setting one corner of the piece on the outfeed table, I take a couple passes over the cutter head. First to remove the tapered amount necessary for squaring the piece and a second pass just to clean up the edge. And you can see the perfectly square corner I get with this simple step when I recheck the piece with a framing square. Then to keep pieces organized and oriented, I put two square marks in one corner of the piece as a reminder that I've double checked it. Write the word bottom on the bottom end for orientation and then mark the opposite edge of the piece to make it clear which edge needs to be trimmed during the cut to final width. As I take these steps, I'm also orienting grain on the end of the piece by establishing which end of the piece is the bottom and squaring that end accordingly. And statistically speaking, for this project, I'm adjusting for squareness with the planer on about half the pieces. And remaining pieces from different pieces of plywood cut in a different sequence were square from the get-go and didn't need any extra attention. At the last minute, I remember to cut these pieces exactly 12 and an eighth inches wide, so there's a little fudge factor for fitting the box joints on the corners of the toolbox after it's glued up. I'm really glad I caught that when I did, because it's so embarrassing to make a pile of perfectly accurate mistakes while the video cameras are running. And it reassures my belief that it's far better to be lucky than good. And to further drive the point home, I make a bright orange X in the upper left hand corner of each one of the blanks to increase my chances of not messing up again later. And now I can present you with a pile of perfect pieces ready to turn into tool toed ends. With accurate pieces cut, now it's time to trace the pattern on the blanks. Because the pattern is 12 inches wide and the blank is 12 and an eighth inches wide, I need to make sure the pattern is centered up. Because I'm making six of these ends and not just two, I took a minute to make a block with a 16th inch deep rabbit on it and stick it to a mag switch to use as a stop and a guide that automatically centers the pattern on the blank. Attaching the rabbited block to the mag switch couldn't be easier. I just spritz a little Starbot accelerator on the mag switch I put a dab of medium CA on the rabbited block. And presto, they're stuck together for this little job. With that little detail done, all I need to do to get accurate, consistent marks on all the blanks is to slide a blank up next to the fence, slide it along the fence till it hits the mag switch, then place the pattern on the blank bumped up against the rabbited block and draw a crisp line around the pattern with a sharp, sharp writer pencil. And by flipping the pattern and retracing it, you can see just how accurate and consistent this process is. And I think that consistency and accuracy like this are hallmarks of a true master carpenter and a next level worth striving for. Once again, I'll be using my band saw for cutting out the profile on these tool tote ends, but because not everyone has a band saw, I'll cover a few pro tips for anyone who uses a jigsaw to cut out these compound curves first. My first recommendation is to clamp it down securely so it doesn't squirm around while you're making the cuts. And it goes without saying that you need to be careful that cutting the piece won't also cut your workbench because that'll turn a good day into a bad day for anyone. Next, use a sharp, fine blade to minimize chipping of the rather delicate veneer on this Russian birch plywood. 
Use firm and steady pressure to let the blade do the work without pushing too hard to break the blade and make a rougher cut or going too slow which can cause the blade to smoke and burn as it goes through the wood. Notice that the blade tends to chip more on the inside of the curve going into the grain which is okay on the scrap piece but not on the work piece and that's why I reverse the direction of cut to keep this side of the cut line more smooth. I've got some roughness here but there's enough margin from the actual part line to that 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 chipping there won't affect the finished piece. You can see in this close-up that I leave plenty of margin between the cut line and the pencil line for the end of the tool tote and I want to keep that to a minimum because it'll be less work for the router to clean that up but I want to make sure I leave plenty so that any variance in the cut like this chipping etc will get flush trimmed away by the flush trim router bit in the cleanup process that comes next. It's also important to pay extra attention how you handle the jigsaw while making these curved cuts and naturally the ideal is to apply even pressure straight forward with the tool as you round the corners but there can be a tendency to push the saw to one side or the other while making the cut and what that does is flex the blade in the cut like this so that the cut itself isn't necessarily perpendicular to the surface. So when I'm making the cut I always opt to put a little inward pressure on the saw to put a little outward flex on the blade to make sure that the cut line doesn't undercut the pattern line and spoil the workpiece. And I'll demonstrate the difference here while I cut the arc for the top of the tool tote end. And first I'm going to cut with pressure outward on the saw which is backwards so you can see what that undercut looks like. Although as you can see I was pushing pretty hard on the saw but that cut still came out pretty square to the face as you can see with this little square and so that cut would not have spoiled the workpiece. So I'm going to do it again in an attempt to screw it up a little more to highlight what I'm talking about. Okay here we go again. Lots of extra outward pressure on the saw as I'm making the cut in an attempt to spoil the cut by making it tilt inwards enough to spoil the workpiece. And you can see by the space behind the square which is a little gap on the bottom when it's tight at the top and that's the angle of the cut. And the cause of that angled cut is putting the pressure the wrong way side to side on the jigsaw as I'm going around the workpiece. I'm sure it seems like I'm making a bigger deal out of this than is necessary because of that slight angle in the cut and naturally the deflection causes more of a problem the thicker the workpiece is. This is only a half an inch and I've got to really try to screw it up but I just kind of wanted to point it out if you're using a jigsaw on this or another project and you can't figure out why the cut comes out so crooked and if you're having that issue just be mindful of pushing the saw straight ahead without side to side deflection and because of that behavior of the blade with that pressure I just keep it in my head when making cuts with a jigsaw that I always put pressure kind of in the opposite direction in this case I put a little inward pressure on it so if anything the blade flexes out and while the cut isn't square it's outside uh, the critical line of the edge of the finished workpiece. So with those few tips you have a little better idea of what you're up against if you're using a jigsaw for a finished piece like this and uh, just some little things to pay attention to so you don't end up with spoiled workpieces at this stage of the game. And I hope it also helps you see that it's totally possible to do a job like this with just a jigsaw or a scroll saw. And with that little lesson in the rear view mirror, I'll practice what I preach and finish rough cutting the profile on this tool tote end. You can see why I prefer a band saw for this because it's quick, clean, and efficient. The quarter inch blade easily follows these complex curves and allows me to cut close to the lines, leaving less for the router to trim off. Plus the band saw cut is a lot cleaner and smoother than that left behind by the jigsaw with the blade that I was using. For what it's worth, the scroll saw works well too, but it's noticeably slower than either of these options. Because these pieces aren't being cut for a pattern where the excess is removed slowly with sandpaper, I'm able to cut more quickly because excess material gets trimmed away in an instant with a router bit later, even if it's a quarter inch or more. So this trimming process is quick, easy, and actually quite fun. You can see in this close-up the difference in the quality of the cut and the shape of the finished piece. Where the jigsaw left rough chipping on the edges, the bandsaw cuts nice and clean. And because of the smoothness and consistency of the bandsaw cut always runs perpendicular to the surfaces, 
I can cut closer to the line with a bandsaw than the jigsaw because I'm not worried about the undercutting I discussed earlier. So I get comparatively smooth, clean edges, which helps justify the investment in a bandsaw in a master carpenter's wood shop. I suppose it would be fair to think that a more efficient way of cutting these out is to use a little spec tape and stack them up and cut them two, three, or four at a time. And I might be inclined to do that on a production basis, but even after cutting out the second tool toed end, the process is pretty quick and efficient, where I'm convinced it's still faster to cut them individually than to cut a stack of them. And this way, if I make a mistake, I only ruin one piece instead of a whole stack. I take the tool toed ends to the drill press for one final rough out step where I use a 5 8 inch Forstner bit to remove the bulk of the material from the handle mortise holes because it makes creating the handle mortises so much quicker, cleaner, and easier. It's fast because it doesn't have to be pretty and all I really need to do is stay inside the lines to win. With all the end blanks roughed out, now I can stick the template onto the blanks for the flush trim routing step that will come up here in a little bit. But you're going to notice I'm using a different step for applying the spec tape that I used just a few minutes ago. And that is thanks to something I learned from Jody at Inspire Woodcraft because patron Eric Smith gave me a heads up on a little video that shows the most common sense way there is to apply two-sided tape, specifically spec tape, without all the fussing to peel away the protective layer of paper from the tape. And this is so stupid simple. I just can't believe it's taken me mm, over six decades to figure out. And the key takeaway is to save yourself the trouble by peeling the backer away from the end of the tape just one time while it's still on the roll and make sure that the backer always extends past the double stick tape itself. So I can just trim this off. Now when I apply, apply these pieces, I can just stick the piece down, peel off the backer, and cut away the spec tape. Never again to have to peel that annoying layer off. The layer is annoying but necessary, but it can be a pain if you have to peel it off every time. But this just works quick and slick. So Jody, never met you, but I can't thank you enough. And I'm still a little clumsy at this because I just learned it, but now that the tape is on there, I'll use the mag switch with that little rabbited block to align the blank so that the template aligns to the blank 1 16th inch away from the edge. Just like that. And now it's off to the router lift for the next important step. Observant viewers have no doubt noticed the router lift in the extension table on my table saw and patrons have seen the unboxing and installation of this lift in the table, but I'm not going to go into that here in this video, but I do want to give a shout out to Mitch at MLCS, who's the exclusive source for the only router lift that has functions controlled by Bluetooth through an app that they made and designed especially for this router lift. I reached out to Mitch some time ago and arranged a collaboration so I could get this exact lift for use in the next level carpentry shop. And I made the decision to do that through insight from another patron, Brian Gamberg, who had one of these lifts a number of years ago and answered a lot of my questions about it as I was shopping between the various woodpeckers and jessums and rocklers, etc. And I settled on this lift for a number of reasons. And you'll see those reasons at work, although I'm not going to go into a full on review of the router lift. I just want to show you this thing in action because I think it's really sweet. So I'm going to go through the steps now to get it set up for using a half inch diameter bottom bearing flush trim uh, router bit with three flutes for trimming these blanks to this pattern. And if you happen to be in the market for a router lift of any sort, I can tell you I've, I've never had an official router lift before and I just reviewed specs and features, etc, cetera, etc cetera, on all the different brands and settled on this one. So I can't really compare it to one that, an analog one with manual controls, but I think anyone who's thinking about putting a router lift or getting a router lift to work with should at least consider the Powerlift Pro by MLCS to decide if you value the features that this offers versus cost, etc. with the other excellent brands out there on the marketplace these days. But I'll set the camera up over here to kind of give you a better view of the system in general. And again, my intent isn't to go into a full-on demonstration 
of this router lift, but I want to give you an idea, an overview of the configuration so you can see and understand how and why I've set things up this way and how I use this configuration to make this work out. But uh, obviously, router lift in the table, and there's no holes in here for cranks on the top or on the side. Um, and this comes with a number of different insert plates, which I'll take out for installing the bit. And that way I can switch from this little diameter hole that keeps sawdust from going down into there to the right size one for this flush trimming process in a little bit. And then I suppose the most unique feature of the MLCS PowerLift Pro is the Bluetooth control function. And that is done with the exclusive app for it, which can be run on a smartphone or a tablet. Uh, and in this case, I got the tablet from MLCS. It's a dedicated tablet with the app installed and the Bluetooth connection is easily set up between the tablet and the lift itself. But uh, there's just a home screen and I can stick that right into the PowerLift Pro app. And that's what the interface looks like. This little uh, bracket here, it's, a st it's small but it's sturdy. So I can keep the tablet at hand when I'm making various changes and corrections. That's not necessary. That tablet can go anywhere because it's Bluetooth. Previous models had a USB cable going down to a control underneath. Uh, I should explain that the tablet itself only controls the up and down function of a stepper motor that raises and lowers uh, the router motor. It doesn't, have to, uh, doesn't turn this on and off. It doesn't adjust the speed. It's solely for raising and lowering the bit, but it does it with incredible precision in increments as small as a thousandth of an inch, which is pretty awesome. But that's what this setup looks like overall. Um, uh, my start and stop switch is under here and the whole thing plugs in. Uh, there's a power strip underneath that the controller and the power switch and the motor and everything's plugged into. So that's how it functions. You'll see me using those things here as this goes along. But I'll move the camera again to show you a couple of the features of the tablet control that are really useful on this and any project. In this view, you can see both the tablet with the app and the router lift itself. And the collet is down below the surface of the table, lowered to a point where this insert will fit above the collet. And that's important because I want to keep that hole plugged when I'm using the table saw for other operations. And one of the real cool features about the tablet control is that this is a setting that I've programmed in to the app. You can see it here. It's set up as memory position number six that I've titled call it down. But now I want to change the bit or add a bit. So I'm just going to hit this bit change feature and you can see the difference in the height setting dimension. And you can also see a slider here and this is what controls how fast or slow the lift moves up and down. And because I'm just going to a preset position, I'll just tap the bit change setting number five in the 100% speed position to raise up the collet so I can easily use the wrenches to install the bit. And that's the height I want to use because I can just lay one of these collet wrenches right on the table and it holds the lower nut. Another example of this feature is if I go to max up. The router comes to its highest position and I can still change the collet, but I have to hold the wrenches. So I programmed this in for the bit change height, which I'll go back to. And so you can see normally I just remove this protective plate hit bit change, it comes right to this height. I can drop in a wrench, slip the bit into place, just like that. Give him a little extra height there, like so. Now I can easily tighten this very snugly in place with very little effort. And that's a wonderful thing. And now I can use any one of a number of ways to lower that bit down to the height that I need for trimming this pattern. And the first one is to just hold the down arrow here. And the bit lowers itself at 100% speed down to whatever height setting I want for the operation at hand. 
Another feature that I can use is a foot switch that also controls the lift raising and lowering mechanism at whatever speed is set on the tablet or whatever speed was last set on the tablet. And that's just another handy option I have at my disposal for adjusting the height of router bits. Now that the collet is below the surface of the table, I can slip in the larger ring that I'm going to use during this operation, tighten them in place, and then I can complete the height setting of that bit for this application. If I zoom in real close, you can probably see that this bit can be lowered about another sixteenth of an inch so that the cutting flutes are just above that half inch thick Russian birch plywood. So I need to lower the bit about a sixteenth of an inch. And I can make that adjustment any number of ways, but the simplest way at this point is to just hit the one sixteenth inch down preset movement to make that change. And because I only have one camera, I'm going to go through those steps again, but you know what I'm doing. Here I'm going to press up a quarter of an inch. You can see the bit is too high, and now I can just press it down a quarter of an inch to take it back to the setting I want. If I decide I don't like that and I need a slight adjustment, I can raise it up another thousandths of an inch or take it down five thousandths, just like that. And because that's so imperceptible, I'll slow the speed down with that slider and I'll raise it a hundredth of an inch like that and drop it a hundredth of an inch. And I'm sure anyone who has a analog controlled router lift knows how to make these adjustments in a very efficient and accurate manner. And I'm not saying for that reason that this is better or worse, but I just, I just think it's pretty sweet. And because I'm still just learning how to be efficient at using this, I'll show you another thing that I'm trying to incorporate. And that is that I've got this bit set at the right height for this project. And I can go in and program that setting right there as a memory position so that I can leave it and come back to it, which isn't that big of a deal on this particular project, but some projects it's very important. And I'll show you the simple steps that it takes to do that. You can see here that this position is 2.482 inches below the maximum up position. And I want to set that. So I'm just going to call this flush trim and then save it. So it saves flush trim at minus 2.482 inches. So that's all good to go. And the way I can use this now is that if I want to lower the bit to cut a sheet of plywood or something in between times, I can just go to max down position, but I want to do that at 100%. And now the bit is below the table surface, so I could move sheet goods across here or whatever I need to do. And then when I come back to wanting to do some flush trimming, I just hit memory position one. And the bit automatically comes back up to the exact right height I need for flush trimming this piece at minus 2.482 inches from the maximum up position. Simple as that. Now that you have an overview of the router lift and its features, I can just ignore that for the rest of the video, but I am excited to show you this thing at work because that's the main point of the collaboration I arrange with MLCS for putting this lift in my shop. So I can show you one more little detail of lift setup that I put in place for this particular flush trimming process. This is a good sized workpiece and I'll be using Smurf gloves for a good grip as I'm doing this flush trimming process. But just for an added measure of safety, I'm going to use a starter pin for this operation. And this is just a little one I made with a nylon bushing and a piece of aluminum tubing. And I'm just going to screw it down into this hole for use in guiding the piece as I start the flush trimming process. But I do want to mention that the MLCS Powerlift Pro comes with only one starter pin hole and it's straight through this axis of the router plate. And for other reasons, I oriented the router lift in the table this way instead of this way. So the starter pin over here isn't really what I want. I want a starter pin on this side, but there's hardware underneath that prevents putting a pin directly across from here. So I rotated these pins 20 degrees and so these two are straight across from each other. This one is 90 degrees at the center so those three separate holes are going to be useful for other functions with the router lift. But the point I wanted to make is that the standard router lift comes with only one hole and it's on this side of the lift. To make that functional I'd have to move the lift around and that changes the wiring and the hookup underneath. So I just drilled and tapped some M6 holes in here for auxiliary use of this router lift to make it a little more versatile 
for my purposes in the shop. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I have two very distinct caution marks here. So I know to stop the flush trimming process at the tangent point of this arc, because this extra material needs to be there for the box joint on the corners later. And after that adventure off in the weeds going on about the router lift and the setup, I'm ready to fire this thing up and route the profile of this first piece. And to do that, I'll remind you that the on off switch is down here on this side of the table saw. It's got a start switch and then a large off safety stop paddle switch there. And the other thing that I have down on the controls here is the speed control for the motor. That's the three and a quarter horse motor from MLCS made specifically for this router lift system. It has a variable speed range from 10,000 to 20,000, I believe. And I've got a control under here for the speed setting. When I turn it on, I'll run it up and run it down a little bit just so you can hear that after the motor's ramped up to speed. And you can get an idea of the speed that I'm using this bit at, which I'm guessing is about mid-range, so probably about 15, 12 to 15,000 RPM for making this cut quick, clean, and smooth. Time for a little PPE. Fire in the hole! Wonderful, wonderful. That is all there is to that. And you can see that I got a nice, smooth, clean profile match between the pattern and the workpiece all the way around, stopping here and here so I don't get into that material for the finger joints later. Quick, clean, and simple. While the template is still attached, I'm going to take care of one more little detail, and that is to square the hole for the mortise through the workpiece using the template as a guide. And I've got a little next level cheat here as one more way to make it easy on myself because nobody else is going to do it for me. I'd be lying if I said it was coincidence that this mortise is exactly three quarters of an inch wide because I just so happen to have a three quarter inch wide hollow chisel mortise that I can use to square up the corners of that mortise quick and easy by just placing this directly down in that mortise hole in the template and tapping it with a plastic mallet. Just like that, boys and girls. It's a beautiful thing. Now I slip a putty knife under the pattern to pry against the spec tape and release the pattern. And remember that that spec tape is some really good stuff and if you get too aggressive with that, it can actually pull veneer out of the workpiece while separating those two. So a little forceful caution is advised. Another benefit of this template system is that the router doesn't know the difference between trimming a piece that was cut on the bandsaw or trimming the one that was cut with the jigsaw. And the three flute flush trim bit, spinning at high RPM, shaves away all the excess material outside the cut line without even breaking a sweat. Oh yeah. Now that the initial fabrication of the tool tote ends are completed to perfection, it's time to segue into the part where we make the handle. And I'll start that process in much the same way as making the ends. And that's with layout and fabrication of a template for the arched tool tote handle. Because the overall length of these tool totes is going to be 24 inches, I start with a piece of quarter inch white melamine that's longer than that and plenty wide for making a handle template. I first lay out an overall length of 26 inches and add a center mark at 13 inches and then add a long line close to and parallel to one of the edges of this piece of melamine. And these initial marks act as a framework for laying out the rest of the pattern. I designed the handle for this tool tote with a one and a half inch bow over the 24 inch width of the tool tote. And so to lay out that arc, I draw a second parallel line an inch and a half down from the one I made previously. 
Next, I'll lay out the total width of the tool tote along that line by measuring 12 inches out each direction from the center so that I can draw an arc using these three points as guides. Now I could use Trig or SketchUp to calculate the radius of that arc with a cord length of 24 inches and a rise of an inch and a half. But I want to show you an old school way that gets this done because it's a lot more simple than creating a center point out here and sweeping that arc to a known radius using a beam compass or some such. And I did a whole video describing this process a long time back. There's a link to it there. But I'll give you an overview of the method here so you can see how it applies quickly and directly to a simple project like this, making an arc for a handle for a tool tote. There's more than one way to go about this, but I'm going to start the process with a couple of perfectly straight, flat, smooth sticks that just so happen to be 3 eighths of an inch thick and an inch and 3 eighths wide. I'm going to make a couple special cuts on the table saw to turn plain sticks into arc drawing sticks. The first step is to set the fence at half the thickness of the piece. So in this case, where the sticks are 3 eighths of an inch thick, I've got the fence set at 3 sixteenths of an inch. And I'll cut in from the end of each of the sticks a kind of random distance that I marked out with a piece of green tape. And then I'll move the fence over a couple more times and repeat the same cut until I've cut away the material on one side of the stick so that the cuts can act as a half lap joint while using the sticks. And I make a mental note to myself to begin with the fence farther away and make successive cuts down to 3 16 of an inch so that I don't end up with a shim wedged down between the spinning blade and my zero clearance insert next time. Next, I take the two sticks to the miter saw and trim off the half lapped ends at a 45 degree angle opposite the angle of the saw cuts so that they fit together a little better in use. Back at the template, I drive a small nail in each of the three points I laid out previously. Next, I'll cover half the half lap joint with strips of spec tape using the little trick from earlier in this video because I never make the same mistake twice. Yeah, normally I make it four or five times just to be sure. And you can tell just how strong and sticky this spec tape is by how difficult it is to work with. But it's excellent stuff and well worth a little extra frustration to use it. Now comes the cool part where the sticks get stuck together in a slick setup for drawing this arc. First, I lay the sticky stick next to the two nails on the left and then place the right stick against the nail on the right side and swing it down till it hits the middle nail over the left stick. Once edges of both pieces are lined up on their respective nails, I simply tap down on the half lap joint to stick the strips together in exactly the right position for drawing an arc with a cord of 24 inches and a bulge of an inch and a half. Once the sticks are stuck, I simply pull out the center nail and put a pencil exactly where the two sticks meet. Now, by starting at a nail on one side and sliding the sticks across from one side to the other, keeping them in contact with the two outside nails at all times, I'm able to draw that perfect arc for the tool tote handle pattern. And it looks exactly like that. And to show the consistency of this method, I'll draw over the line a second time to darken it up and mention that I'm careful not to exert too much force downward on the sticks because doing that could flatten the arc if the two sticks pivot on that spec tape. And that simple process gives me a clean, smooth arc of exactly the right specifications for the tool tote handle. And this is one of those projects that takes considerably more time the first time through because the time spent making the sticks and explaining things, that spec tape is good stuff. But I'll just save these two sticks in the drawer. I've got a set in there already, but I wanted to show you how to make these. Um, but if you save these, they can be used for all sorts of arcs as long as the overall span of the arc or the cord is equal to or less than the length of the stick. Basically, the two sticks have to be twice the width of the arc that you're drawing. But I can save those for another day and use them again, but now you know how this process is done. And if you decide to make a toolbox that was 18 inches wide or 36 inches with the same rise to the handle, it's the same process, but the layout points are just adjusted accordingly for the length of arc and the height that you want to make. But coming back in out of the weeds from that, I can pull these nails and get this template trimmed up so I can finish up with the cool pistol grip feature for the center of the handle. First, I trim off one end of the template so it's symmetrical, and then it's back to the band saw to cut along the arc line very carefully for a nice smooth arc on the pattern. I clamp the template in the bench habit to make fairing this long gradual curve quicker and easier. And I use a little hack to make sure the curve comes out bump free and proud. 
All I do is take a short section of the cutoff arc and use it as a sanding block to help guide the sandpaper to remove ripples and saw marks from the curve. I start with 36 grit paper and once it's all evened out I switch to 80 grit paper to make the curve feel as good as it looks. How's about that? Once I'm satisfied with the curve on the template, I flip the sandpaper over and use it to lap the curve on the scrap piece to give it a convex arc that's a perfect match to the template. Now I can set up this mating piece as a little marking guide that I'll use for developing the template. I just tape it down to kind of hold it in place and then spritz the back of a strip of melamine with Starbond Accelerator. Add a little bit of Starbond Medium CA glue to the piece. And using a framing square as a guide, I stick the straight piece to the curved piece to make this slick, handy little marking guide to help finish layout of the template. And what that gives me is a handy little guide that I can use to draw a radial line anywhere along the curve with no fuss or special geometry. The first job for this little guide is to draw a concentric arc one and three quarter inches away from the curve of the template to represent the overall height or width of the handle itself. And I do that by marking the edge of the guide and cutting a little v-notch in it with a hacksaw to serve as a shoulder for the fine tip of a sharp writer pencil. And this little hack is tough to beat for quick and slick, in my humble opinion. The top of the arc gets a small depression to enhance the look of the pistol grip. So I mark two inches either side of center for a four inch overall width and then scribe a line an eighth of an inch down to define that depression. The pistol grip itself consists of four little arcs with a one inch radius and a bulge of three eighths of an inch. So I put another nick in the guide to draw a concentric circle for the centers of those four little arcs. With a compass set to a half inch, I first mark out centers for those little arcs by starting at the center of the handle and then draw the arcs one at a time along that concentric center line. When I'm done drawing the four arcs, I use a scratch awl and a hammer to highlight the centers of each of the one inch circles that make up the four notches for the pistol grip handle. With those four center points as a guide, it's back to the drill press where I use a one inch Forstner bit to perfect the profile of this pistol grip handle. While I still have straight edges to work with, I'll add a few permanent reference lines on the handle template for use later when it comes time to lay out tenons on the handle itself. First, I draw a reference line side to side across the handle that'll help keep everything square with the world when working on the actual handle. Next, I add marks 12 inches on either side of the center for the overall length of the handle and the toolbox. And last but not least, I add a mark that represents the inside of the ends of the toolbox because that Russian birch isn't exactly a half inch thick and I just want to keep that in mind when laying out tenons on the handle a little bit later. And I might as well darken up the center line itself while I'm at it by using that little radial line guide I made earlier. And that should be marvelous. And now it's back to the band saw for the final two cuts on this handle template. I use a scrap of the cut curve to fill the arc on the underside of the handle. And with the clean curve cut by the bandsaw, it takes just a few licks to fair the curve to perfection, or at least to my satisfaction. Just like that. The last step to complete the pistol grip profile is to cut to the concentric arc drawn an eighth inch in from the top arc of the handle. And I finish up by fairing the curve with an 80 grit best block for demanding sanding. So the template is good to go. With the pistol grip handle template complete, it's time to make up blanks for making the handles. And I make these as a sandwich of two pieces of hardwood with a Russian birch core. That's half inch Russian birch. And I'll just use the handle template to determine the size of those blanks. And as you remember, I made this template longer than the tool tote itself, but the handle blank is going to be 24 and an eighth inches long as will the sides when the time comes. And that leaves an extra 16th of an inch on each end for trimming and flushing up everything once the tool tote is assembled and glued together. So using the template, I laid this out and determined that I need a piece that's three and a half inches wide. And then this is 24 and an eighth inches long. And that's big enough to make the handle itself with a little bit of template sticking off each end just for finishing the curves when the time comes. Cutting these laminations to size is routine mill work. I first rip three strips of Russian birch plywood to three and a half inches wide. Since these pieces get sandwiched between hardwood faces, grain direction isn't a factor. So I use a piece of less desirable end grain offcut for two of the three handles. Because grain direction 
is only aesthetic, not structural. Then I stacked those three strips of Russian birch plywood and gang cut them to the 24 and an eighth inch finished length that I need. Since I'm using some beautiful but small hardwood offcuts for face laminations, I plane them down from pieces of random thickness to a consistent thickness of a quarter inch before they're ripped to the three and a half inch finished width. And obviously, this size would change if the height of the arc or the length of the handle changed. But I'm good to go with three and a half by 24 and an eighth inches for this. And to complete the sandwich, I have pieces of hardwood a quarter inch thick and then that half inch Russian birch for a handle that's about one inch thick. And the exact thickness isn't really that important at this point. What matters is that I have these three pieces all the same width and length for gluing up. And I'm making three of these tool totes and I decided to make one with carry wood. This is some really cool stuff here. These pieces were in a mine in the Black Hills for 85 to 100 years. And I was able to salvage some of that carry wood as it came out of the mine as they're rebuilding it for the Sanford lab there. And I had pieces that were big enough to make the full three and a half by 24 and an eighth inches in that species. The other two, the other two tool totes, the other two tool totes I'm making, uh, the handles are going to be walnut sandwiching that Russian birch. And I just had a scrap of walnut, so I had to do a little creative splicing here to get pieces that were wide enough at the 24 and an eighth inch length to work for the handle. But as you'll see, by adding a couple little pieces on the ends here, I was able to make pieces this wide, wide enough for the tool tote handle. And I'm just telling you about that in case you're using some exotic wood for the handle and only have small pieces. You know, I just, I just need this shape. I don't need to have this full rectangular piece because there'll be more waste from this piece than from this piece. But with all that said, it's time to apply some glue and laminate these sandwich cookies for tool tote handle blanks. Clamping nine laminations for three handles can kind of be messy business, but I've got everything set up here on the work surface to make the process as quick, clean, and efficient as possible. I'm using Type Bond 3 glue for these because it's a little thinner than other glues and it's beyond strong enough to make these handles durable and useful over their life. I squiggle a healthy dose of that Type Bond 3 on the two outer laminations and roll it out to an even coat using a little grooved silicone roller. Once everything's glued up, I stack the laminations together and then, totally out of character, shoot a one inch pin nail into the scrap on the upper corners of the handle to keep all the laminations lined up when I clamp all the handle blank sandwiches together in a few minutes. Naturally, I pay extra close attention to lining up the laminations before pulling the trigger on that pin nail because once that nail is in, the laminations are stuck for good. Working quickly and systematically in a cool shop, it doesn't take long to butter up both sides of all the laminations so that all three handle blank sandwiches are ready for clamps. I grab a handful of my favorite 12 inch Irwin clamps and add a piece of half inch MDF to either side of the stack of blanks to help even out pressure from those Irwin clamps as I put the screws to this stack of handle blanks. Even though I'm reluctant to use pin nails for alignment on a glue up like this, they're perfect for the job of holding all these slippery layers together as clamp pressure is applied. And the fact that those pin nails will get trimmed away in the waist when the handles are cut to shape gives me relief from the feeling of hypocrisy I get when I disparage the practice as unprofessional when I see it used by others in finished work. After giving the stack of laminated handle blanks more than enough time for the glue to dry, I can remove the forest of clamps and separate the individual handle blanks for the steps that follow. A place for every clamp and every clamp in its place. The separated blanks are looking good, so I use a sharpened putty knife to scrape away little bits of residual dried glue and sawdust from the glue up process. Even with careful alignment that didn't shift during glue up, the edges are slightly uneven because of irregularities in the hardwood laminations. So I take a whisker off one edge on the joiner and then true up the other edge on the table saw and get everything lined up so both edges are straight and clean while sacrificing less than a sixteenth of an inch of extra width. The next step for preparing these blanks is to make sure that the ends are flush and clean and that all three blanks are exactly the same length. And I've mentioned a couple times in this video already how I like to make it easy on myself because nobody's going to do it for me. But right now I'm in a predicament where I did not do that. 
Uh, I made these pieces. Remember, I cut them 24 and an eighth, which is the finished length I want. But because there's just a slight difference in the pieces on the ends of all three of these, I've got to trim both ends to get them clean and have them the same length. And so to make it easy on myself, I should have just made these at 24 and a quarter, 24 and a half. Then I could just cut the ends off nice and clean at the finished length. I'm not quite sure why I did that, but I think it has to do with the size of the uh, walnut piece I had and I didn't have a bunch of extra length. I barely got what I needed out of those off cuts. But I'm going to shave the best end of these and then cut the other end and I'm going to be a little less than 24 and an eighth that I want to end up with. But as long as I'm a bit longer than 24 inches exactly, I'll be able to sand the, the ends of the tenons flush a little bit later. Live and learn. The variation on the ends is actually so minor as to be insignificant, but it's enough to bug me to the point I want to clean it up. So I align one end so the discrepancy is averaged out and hold the blanks together with a couple pieces of one inch green frog tape so that I can gang cut both ends of all three with a minimum amount of extra fuss. I decided to back up the frog tape with a small bar clamp because with such close tolerances, even a small shift makes a big difference. But now I can gang cut the blanks on the miter saw without worrying about spoiling the blanks. With this setup, I'm able to shave off a bare minimum of length off both ends of the blanks to settle my OCD anxiety over the accuracy of these three handle blanks. And after that series of stressful steps, it turns out to be much ado about nothing because I'm just barely shy of the overall length of 24 and an eighth inches that I was shooting for from the get-go. Before removing the clamp, I used a sterid combination square to mark the exact center of this bundle of blanks for consistency in the layout step that comes next. And I use a soft leaded carpenter pencil for these marks because the dark hardwood makes it difficult to see pencil marks used for important alignment during layout. Ultimately, those center marks will help me align the pattern on the blank. But first, I'll lay out and cut the cheeks of the tenons while the blanks still have straight edges and square ends. The metric thickness of this Russian birch plywood can vary a bit and it's rarely exactly a half inch thick. So I clamp two pieces tightly together and hold the 24 inch mark on one side of the two pieces and read just about 23 and a 16th on the other side. So I know that that's the length I need between the shoulders on the tenons on each end of the handles. So I'm going to go with that. To lay out the length of the tenons on each end of the blank, I use a double square set to a strong half an inch to make a mark in that distance from both ends of a blank and then double check the distance using a tape measure by burning 10 inches from the mark on one end of the blank and reading 33 and a 16th inch on the other end. And with those layout marks, I know that if I leave the pencil mark for the shoulder on both ends of the blank, the space in between those shoulders will be exactly 23 and a 16th inches and the overall length of the toolbox will be exactly 24. With the length of the tenant marked, the next thing I want to do is lay out the thickness. So I clamp one of the blanks in the bench habit to get this done. If you remember from earlier, the mortise is three quarters of an inch wide. So I readjust my double square and mark the same distance in from each face of the blank. So that the space between the layout lines is exactly three quarters of an inch. So it'll match the width of the mortise in the handles. Now I'll use those rabbit marks to set the fence and the blade on the table saw to cut the cheeks on the tenons on both ends of all the blanks. First, I set the blade height to the pencil mark I just made for the tenon cheeks. As per usual, I'm conservative with this setting so I can test the depth of cut with the actual mortise and sneak up on the final thickness for the best fit between the tenon and mortise. So I start out with a setting that'll leave the pencil mark that I just made and should make the tenon a little wider than I want it for a good fit in the mortise. Next, I use the same conservative approach for setting the fence for the length of the tenon. I just slide the fence over so the cut left by the blade leaves the pencil mark for the tenon's shoulder, which I can always adjust incrementally to establish the overall length of the handle between the shoulders of these tenons on the ends. Once everything's set up to my satisfaction, I use a miter guide to make successive cuts to establish the face of the tenon on both sides of one end of the blank. It should go without saying that it takes a whole lot longer to explain and demonstrate these steps than it does to actually do them. I'll also explain that I'm using a thin kerf saw blade for this because, uh, frankly, I'm just too lazy to set up a dado blade to make these cuts in one pass. And even with tenons on both ends of all the blanks, I think I'm still time ahead doing it this way versus setting up a dado blade for a simple operation like this. 
After cutting the cheeks on that first tenon, I use one of the tool toed ends to gauge the thickness of the tenon and see that I can raise the blade ever so slightly to make the tenon thinner for a good fit in that mortise. And with that nearly imperceptible adjustment, I was able to adjust the tenon width for a snug preliminary fit in the mortise and the end of the tool toe. And with the blade height setting set, I'll cut cheeks on the tenon on the other end of this handle blank so that I can double check the distance between the shoulders on both ends of the handle and adjust the fence to achieve that 23 and a 16th inch distance between the shoulders on each end of the handle. Now when I double check the length, you can see that the distance is just a little too much, which is a good thing at this stage. So I make a slight adjustment to the fence to move it farther away from the blade, which will lengthen the tenons and shorten the distance to the 23 and the 16th inches and after. After adjusting the fence, I make one cut for each shoulder of the tenons on each end of the handle in a process I call sneaking up on it to dial in the length I'm looking for without spoiling a piece in the process. Ta-da! That is exactly what I'm looking for. And now, because all three handle blanks are identical in width, length, and thickness, I can use this dialed-in setup to confidently cut cheeks for the tenons on both ends of the other two handle blanks with accurate, consistent results. In this close-up of the finished tenons, you can see that the results are consistent and accurate, even though setup and execution is pretty straightforward. I didn't elaborate on this before, but I did orient the grain of the pieces of these faces so that the grain kind of matches with the handle. So each one of my blanks has a top and a bottom because of this subtle arch or curve in the grain on the walnut. And on the carry wood, there were some defects on there. So I set that up so that it'll get cut away, leaving the best wood for the handle itself and those defects and undesirable features into the scrap. So that's kind of a next level thing that's going on here, even though I haven't talked about it, but it's something to think about depending on the wood you have to use for the faces of the handle. If it's straight grain and it's all clean, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, another thing here is that if these offcuts were wider, I could just draw the arc right on there. But because I made these a minimum width because of the wood I was using, the template actually requires a wider piece to be laid out on. And in this case, it's a quarter inch wider. So I'm going to show you how I accurately trace the pattern onto the blank for rough sawing on the band saw. Even though in your situation you might have a wide enough blank where this step isn't really necessary. And here's what I'm trying to explain. I want to trace the pattern on the blank so that I can cut it out on the band saw. But if you remember, I made the pattern longer than the workpiece itself, and that just helps for flush trimming the curves in upcoming steps. But what that also means is that I need an extra quarter inch of space for drawing the template on the workpiece so that the pattern fits on the piece. In this case, this extra length requires about a quarter inch extra width. So I just made a quarter inch strip that fits down behind here like that. And now when I bump the pattern up against the fence on both sides, the arc of the pattern fits on the workpiece on both sides, top and bottom. So this just helps me align the pattern to the workpiece this way so that it's balanced out and with this simple setup, I can now align the center mark on the pattern that we made earlier and the center mark on the workpiece or the blank that I made earlier, just like that. And the tenon marks line up on both ends just like they're supposed to because everything is symmetrical. But I can hold this accurately in position and trace out the pattern on the workpiece. And because the wood is dark and it's hard to see pencil marks, I'm just using a sharp Sharpie marker for this process so that the lines are easier to follow when trimming away waste on the bandsaw. And that's what I want it to look like at this stage of the game. And this is where you can see how parsimonious use of wood scraps comes into play because all these gaps left in the faces on these walnut handles just gets trimmed away so I'm not wasting good wood as scrap and get to use some really nice pieces for these handles that makes them both special and unique. And I gotta say, that right there is cutting it a lot closer than I'm comfortable doing. But as I like to say, it's better to be lucky than good. And now these blanks are ready for rough trimming on the band saw. Keep in mind, if you're cutting these out with a jigsaw, pay extra attention to how you handle the jigsaw itself, putting even firm pressure straight forward 
or flexing it a little bit to get the blade to deflect out because with this thicker workpiece it's a lot easier to deflect the blade the wrong way and actually spoil it. I'm kind of spoiled because the bandsaw makes such quick clean work of roughing out these blanks. And if I were in a mass production setting, I'd switch to a wider blade. That makes making long sweeping cuts a little bit easier because the wide blade tracks better. As it is, I make a couple of special relief cuts before cutting out the bottom of the handle because I want to leave the center part of the blank intact for making the four rounded finger notches in the underside of the handle in an upcoming step a little easier. You can see that I leave a small but distinct margin between the cut line and the pattern line to make sure the router has something to trim, but not too much when it comes time to flush trim the handle. Well, it's a bit embarrassing to admit that I got ahead of myself in these steps, but it highlights the point that I try to make that sequence is really important on a build project like this. And the embarrassing thing is that I left out one step in the sequence for making these handles and that I bandsawed this to shape before I made the other two cuts for the tenons on the end of the handle, which is a whole lot easier to do when it's rectangular in shape versus when it's cut to a curved shape like this. But I'm just going to call it a teachable moment and go back to the step I left out on this blank and do it the way I intended in the proper sequence on these two blanks. Unfortunately, there's no good way or time to deal with this, so I'll just cover it now with this segment I'm producing months after I discovered the handle width problem I previously flagged in this video. After going through all the handle making steps to get to this point, I discovered there was a problem with the one and three quarter inch handle width. And the best way to show you the problem is with one of three handles that I brought back with me from the future. And this looks great, right? Well, it is great, except that it's not. And as fate would have it, I didn't discover the problem until I rounded the thumbnail profile on the top and bottom of the handle in an upcoming segment of the video while dry fitting the handle in its mortise on the end of the tool tote. If you look close in this macro shot, you can see the corners of the mortise in the end piece are exposed by the thumbnail profile on the top of the handle. It's a small but glaring problem that's easy to avoid but difficult to fix. The best way to avoid the problem in the first place is to make the handle two inches wide instead of the one and three quarter inch width I started out with and also to lower the tenons on the ends. Since I couldn't avoid the problem after finding it, I had to make a new wider template and three new handles two inches wide using all the same steps shown in the video to this point. With these two simple alterations, the new wider handles will cover the mortises in the ends of the tool tote like they're supposed to in the first place. Another way to get around this problem on an inch and three quarter wide handle is to make the mortise and tenon smaller and shift the position of the tenon in relation to the top of the handle. But I chose to go with two inch wide handles because they not only cover the mortise better, but are also more comfortable to hold, especially with a tool tote full of tools. Fortunately, all viewers need to do to avoid the embarrassment I feel is to use the altered dimensions shown here and in the available PDF plan set when going through the rest of the handle making steps that follow. Since it's months after the fact, I made a quick handle blank mock-up to show you the altered layout process for the handle tenons that substitute for the original layout sequence you'll see next in this video. To locate the tenon on the end of the handle, put one mark three eighths of an inch down from the top of the handle and another mark an inch and a half down from that, squaring those marks across the cheek of the tenon where the combination of a wider handle and lower tenon position resolve the vexing problem of the exposed mortise so I can return you to the build where we were before this awkward interlude. And this should demonstrate the importance of sequence because I've got the layout lines for the final shape of the handle on the blank and I need to lay out the height of that tenon on the end here. So I can use this top curve point right here as a starting point. And then if you remember, on the end of the tool tote, the mortise is an inch and a half tall. So I want to make the tenon to fit that mortise at an inch and a half tall, which will be right there. And so those two lines represent the height of this tenon in relation to the curves on the top and the bottom of the handle. And I hope you can see by looking through the mortise that if I leave those two sharpie marks, the tenon will be a good rough size for final fitting with a file later when it comes time to assemble the tool tote. 
Now with the tenon shoulders and those layout lines as guides, I can set the blade height and fence distance to cut the tenon to an inch and a half in height, quickly, consistently, and most importantly, accurately. Once the blade height and fence are set, I use a miter guide with an auxiliary fence to make a clean cut for the top of the tenon and then take a couple extra passes so that the top of the tenon is complete when I shape the arc on the top of the handle. I cut the tops of the tenons on both ends of all three blanks before switching the fence setup and using the same arrangement to establish the inch and a half height of the tenon on the bottom of the handle. In case you're wondering how I dealt with the handle cut prematurely on the bandsaw, I'll show you this little sequence where I use spec tape to attach the cut blank to one of the full blanks so that it's oriented just like it needs to be. And I can run the blanks that are stuck together through the setup on the table saw to cut the tenons on this piece even though it doesn't have full parallel edges on it anymore. And this works because this bandsaw piece has a square edge or a flat edge here and flat ends on it. And that allowed me to just line everything up and stick them together so that those cuts will be made nice and clean on that piece even though it's already curved. And while I'm making the cuts, I reflect on my gratitude that I figured out I got ahead of myself because this would have been a little trickier to do if I had cut all three blanks out on the bandsaw already before making these tenon cuts. Since these tenons end up as wedged tenons, I do a quick layout on the end of one of these for a pattern so I can set up the saw to cut slots for those tenon wedges later on in the build. Using a double square, I measure 5 16 from the top and bottom of the tenon and then measure another eighth inch to represent the slot for the tenon wedge. And then square those marks around from the end of the tenon to the cheek. Once I've got wedge slots marked on the cheeks of all the tenons, I set the mag switch fence on my drill press for the length of the tenon and use a 7 32 inch brad point bit to drill clearance slash relief holes at the root of the slots in those tenons. And because I'm actually doing this in the right sequence, I can use the same setup at the table saw by lowering the blade and adjusting the fence to make slots for wedges in these tenons during glue up. Well, I certainly took the long way around to get back to where I started, but now that all the work on the tenons on the ends of the handles is done, I can go to the stage in the process where it actually is time to cut these handles to rough size on the bandsaw. Observe it viewers will notice that I removed the rip fence from the bandsaw so the large cast iron table is unobstructed and allows me to make relief cuts on the underside of the handle without special gymnastics and that just makes it quicker and easier to cut this handle to rough size. And remember in the process of cutting away waste off the handle I'm also cutting the piece with the 23 gauge pin nails in them so I'm not concerned about hitting them in upcoming steps as I refine the handles to finished shape. With all the handles cut to rough size, I'm going to answer the question that's been nagging at so many of you viewers, and that is, why didn't I just cut the arc across the bottom of the handle where the notches for the pistol grip are? And I'm going to answer that question right here and right now. And the first part of that answer is that I want the template stuck to the workpiece before I make those notches. And I've got three pieces of spec tape there, and I'll just line up the template to the magic marker marks little sharpie marks made earlier. I'm lining up the center mark and the sharpie marks here carefully like so. That is going to do it. And if you look close you can see that little sharpie mark along there and notice that there's margin of extra wood all around the profile of the pattern and then a big lug here for the pistol grip. And now for the second part of the answer to your question. And the honest answer is that I've kind of got a lazy streak and I could just rough trim the workpiece near these arcs and then use the router bit, the flush trim bit, to cut those three or those four little notches. But the lazy man's way is to rely on the drill press with the one inch Forstner bit chucked up there that I used for cutting these notches in the first place. And using the template as a guide, I'm essentially flush trimming the workpiece to the pattern using a Forstner bit instead of a flush trim router bit. But with the delicate points left between the arcs, this is a more reliable and certain way of getting the job done compared to the risk of chipping those little points off with a flush trim router bit. With the four curved notches made quick, clean, and smooth on the drill press, I fire up the bandsaw one more time to remove the last bit of large scrap from the workpiece. And that, boys and girls, is tough to beat for speed or perfection. This is starting to look an awful lot like a handle for a tool tote, <laughs> don't you think? Well, I do, and 
We've been hanging out here in the shop for over an hour already. And I don't know about you, but I'm about ready for a little break. But truth be told, I don't want to do an infomercial any more than you want to listen to one. So I'll keep it short. I'll just ask you to subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. And follow links in the video description below to everything you need to know about tools and supplies seen and used in this video. You'll also find an excellent chapter list down there to help you navigate through this long masterclass video if you don't have time to watch it all in one setting. And I'll finish up with a big shout out to all the patrons of Next Level Carpentry who you can thank for their support on Patreon. Their generous support helps justify all the time that it takes to produce uber long in-depth videos like this one so you can watch for free without a paywall blocking this premium content. Now, if everyone will hit the thumbs up button on the count of three, one, two, three, boom, I'll quit all this yattering and get back to work. With the template still attached from drilling the round notches for that pistol grip, it's time to flush trim the rest of the profile of the handle. So I've got the starter pin and half inch flush trim bit set back up in the Powerlift Pro and I'll dial it back in to the flush trim preset setting to get this done. With everything set up and dialed in, flush trimming the handle blank to the shape of the pattern is quick, clean, and easy. I'm using a brand new white side flush trim bit, part number 2407, that has a half inch shank, a half inch cutting diameter, and a one and a half inch cut length that gives an amazingly clean, smooth finish to the handle blank in a simple, straightforward step. And now for the big reveal, when I pop the pattern loose from the handle blank, so you can see what a tool tote handle looks like at this stage of the project. And it can take a little bit of filing, fussing, and fitting at this stage, but I can give you a glimpse of where we're headed with this tool tote build. By slipping that handle through the mortises on the tool tote ends to give you a pretty good idea of where this project is at and where it's headed. You can see how the tenon on the handle fits through the end of the tool tote with slots for wedges that will go in during assembly and just the slightest bit of protrusion of that tenon past the face so it'll get sanded nice, smooth, and flush after glue up. I want to congratulate everyone that's still with me at this stage of the build because we've come quite a long ways to get here and there's still a good ways to go. But I need to get the rest of the project caught up to this stage by shaping these other handles before I come back to the last major step in the build, which is going to be making the sides for the tool tote and then going through the process of creating that subtle but attractive sweep in the sides of the tool tote in a classy touch that matches the rest of the sculpted design of this project. So with the magic of video production, I'm going to go back to work. You can relax and we'll get back together in an instant where I pick up and make the sides for this tool tote. Ready? Go. Because I'm working with a bunch of beautiful but random wood to make sides for three tool totes, it involves some extra milling. To come up with the 18 separate pieces I need, I start by cutting pieces to rough length and then joining one edge straight so they're ready for ripping to rough width. Then the rough sized pieces get jointed flat and planed to uniform rough thickness for glue up. All 18 of the pieces you see here are longer than they'll end up. I left them a skosh thicker too so that I can take a final pass off both faces with the thickness planer after everything is glued up. These 12 pieces are for tops and bottoms of the tool tote sides and I milled them with extra width and edges that are exactly parallel with one edge jointed perfectly square and straight for glue up. These six pieces are for center strips on the sides of the tool tote and need some extra special treatment before they are ready for glue up. All this extra explanation is necessary because the tool totes being built in this video will have an accent stripe on both sides and I use that for branding like you see here. But if you're building a tool tote with solid sides without any accent stripe or embellishment, you can skip ahead to this timestamp I'll put up here and join back up with the rest of us when the sides for these next level tool totes are ready for final thickness planing after glue up. For everyone that's sticking with me, follow closely and hang on tight as I head off into the weeds and explain the special treatment for these strips here that I mentioned just a little bit ago. The special treatment is all about the layout of the box joints on the ends of the tool tote sides. 
And to make this look right when it's all done, the center strip needs to be exactly as wide as three of those fingers. As you'll see, for design purposes and ease of measurement, I decided to make the height of all the lugs and notches exactly five eighths of an inch. There's 11 of them total, and that makes a total height of the sides, a total finished height of the sides, six and seven eighths inches. Uh, there's three segments coming up from the bottom of the tool tote. The stripe has three segments, and then there's five on the top for the total of 11 segments. And so the stripes themselves need to be exactly the same width as the height of three of those segments. And at 5 eighths of an inch, uh, 5 eighths times 11 makes 6 and 7 eighths. And to get everything just so, I took a piece of wood and I ripped it to exactly 5 eighths of an inch, and I dialed that in until 11 of those little pieces lined up together make exactly 6 and 7 eighths so that I know on the bottom of the tool tote, three of those lugs are going to be the bottom piece. That's what these are. And because they need to be glued up, these pieces are a little wider than that amount. It'll get trimmed off later. Then the second three lugs are going to be the accent stripe. And because it gets sandwiched in and glue up, this needs to be exactly the same height as three of these lugs. And remember, I calculated the exact width of these lugs or the exact thickness of these for this purpose because this will get used for setting up the box joint jig later after the sides are made and they can be notched along with the ends. And this whole explanation is clearly off in the weeds, but I hope I've shown the importance of getting these strips to be exactly an inch and seven eighths high, which is three times five eighths, so that everything lines up when the box joints are cut later in the build. So here's when I join these straight and then I'll use the thickness planer as a widthness planer so that all these are smooth and consistent at exactly the right width and ready for glue up. All six of these strips are the exact same width and they have parallel edges, but as you can see, they're two inches wide. So that allows me some room for further straightening and trimming so that they end up at exactly inch and seven eighths, which is exactly the width of three of these gauge blocks that I'll use for everything in the setup process for the joinery on the corners of the tool tote. Because the accuracy and consistency of all six of these strips is so important, I start by double checking the joiner fence to make sure it's perfectly square and then plane a whisker off of one edge of each of the pieces so that it's a perfectly straight reference edge that I can use to true up the other edge of all these pieces before widthness planing. You can see I use a special handle forward design of my professional carpenter's push sticks for planing these edges safely. Now I'll put that perfectly straight jointed edge against the fence and rip the opposite edge exactly parallel at an inch and 15 sixteenths. Just a sixteenth of an inch stronger than the final width of the piece. Now the blocks are all of uniform thickness. They have one jointed edge which is perfectly straight and now a saw cut edge that's perfectly straight and parallel to the jointed edge. And they're all one sixteenth thicker or wider than they need to be. And I want to plane both edges in the thickness planer, which I'll use as a widthness planer, so that all six pieces are precisely the same before glue up. And a little hack I use at this stage to make sure both edges get planed is to just take a pencil and draw some marks across the edges, flip them over, and draw different marks across the other edges. I angle one set of pencil marks and just draw the other one straight across. So if anything gets mixed up, I can always tell which edge is which just by realigning edges with marks that go the same way, like so. With parts like these where width is so critical, I don't want to rely on a ruler or settings on the planer for this final width. So I grab my Starrett dial caliper to guide me through the process. I hope the lighting is good so you can see what I can see, which is that these pieces are indeed 1 and 15 sixteenths of an inch wide, which is exactly where they need to be. And that allows me to take a 32nd of an inch of material off each edge in the widthness planer to dial them in. And like I just said, I don't rely on this dial over here. I don't rely on the depth of cut. And I only use this gauge as a range finder. And the foolproof sequence that I use to make sure the width ends up exactly where it needs to be is this. I know that the height setting is higher than it needs to be for these pieces because the pieces slide right through there. I know that these pieces are exactly 1 and 15 16 7 inch wide and I need to take a 32nd off each edge 
to end up with the final width. The other thing I know is that one turn of the crank on a DW735 is a sixteenth of an inch. Half a turn is a thirty-second of an inch. And I also know that with this particular planer, when the handle is in the nine o'clock position, that it's exactly the setting it shows on the gauge. And so to calibrate the planer to the width that I need to end up with, I put the stack of pieces in the planer, turn the planer on, and then lower the crank handle until the feed rollers engage and I can hear that it's planing a little bit off the top surface of this stack of pieces. And because I need the dusk processor, which is quiet, and the planer, which is noisy, I'm just explaining what you're going to see happen. So I'll fire this up and talk you through the process that I use to dial these pieces in to the exact precise width that I'm after. I've turned the planer on and lower the crank handle until feed rollers and cutters engage and take a shaving off the top edge of these pieces. After the pieces come out of the planer, I lower the crank handle another quarter of a turn and run the pieces through again with the same edge up to make sure they're all planed clean and consistent. And once one edge of the pieces is planed flat and clean, I flip them over top for bottom and end for end, which you can see because each of the edges has pencil marks showing that it hasn't been planed yet. Next, I'll rotate the crank handle, not quite another half of a turn, send the pieces through the planer, double check the width again, and make a final adjustment with the handle before sending the pieces through for a final pass to dial in the exact width that I'm after. I don't think you can get any more inch and seven eighths than that, but I confirm that everything is copacetic by matching up three of the gauge blocks on the width of these pieces for a perfect match. All the extra time it takes to make precision strips for an accent stripe on the side of a master carpenter tool tote isn't lost on me. And it's pretty easy to see that you could save yourself a whole lot of extra effort and trouble by just making the sides of the tool tote out of a solid piece of wood and notching the ends for joining around the corners. But I really think that the whole exercise of making precision strips and planning out the joinery so that the finger notches on the box joints all line up is worth it. And it's what separates a tool tote like this from run of the mill toolboxes and tool totes that are equally functional, but not nearly as impressive in the end, in my humble opinion. And after doing the final fitting and grain matching on these pieces, it's finally time to glue these strips together to make tool tote sides. I use a variety of orientation lines on each set of three pieces so that I can keep track of them during glue up, confident in the fact that the grain orientation will end up as intended. I'm fully aware that the system I use for edge gluing pieces like this is out of the ordinary, but I find it simple, straightforward, and effective. I first clamp the bottom strip in the bench habit, apply a thin strip of tight bond 3 glue to the edge of the piece directly from the bottle, and then evenly distribute that glue with the next strip of wood. And it takes just a few seconds to evenly distribute the glue so I can repeat the process on the next glue joint. Quickly applying and distributing glue and working the pieces around where suction from the setting glue stabilizes the pieces to the point I can start placing clamps. I start by placing the first clamp on the back side near the middle of the piece, snug it up a little bit, and add another clamp to the far end. Because the vice jaws are in the way, I add the next clamp to the opposite end of the piece all the while making sure all three pieces are perfectly flush on the face. Alternating clamps from the front side and the back side keeps the pieces from taco shelling as I add pressure to the glue joints. With three of four clamps in place, I loosen the vise and remove the piece so I can add the fourth clamp on the front side to equalize the clamping pressure. Once four clamps are in place, I bring the piece over to my table saw top and use sawdust, aka guy glitter, and a putty knife to clean up the line of glue squeeze out along both edges of the joint on both faces of the piece. I'm fully aware that this practice is a bit unconventional too, but you'll never catch me using wet rags for glue squeeze out. Ugh, just makes a mess. Anyways, that's the process I use. I'll lather, rinse, repeat until all six sides are glued up and then call it a day while that glue sets and the pieces are all ready for the next step in the build. Well, for any doubters out there, yes, I really did glue up all 18 of those pieces on edge in the bench habit, and it probably took barely a half an hour to get all that done. And now that these have dried overnight, they are plenty dry for the next step. And if you remember, for the next step, I'm going to run these through the thickness planer once on each face, 
because I glued them up about a 32nd of an inch strong so I can take a light pass off of both faces to clean up any little glue smudges that might be on here. And they all came out great and that's a good thing because these side pieces are kind of show pieces on the finished tool totes. Three quick things before I run these through the thickness planer again. And the first thing is to confirm that the width of the Russian birch plywood I'm working with is in fact 1 32nd of an inch less than a half an inch. And that all these blanks, because they were all milled at the same time, are consistent at exactly a half an inch. So I'm confirming that I've got to take a 64th of an inch off of each face. And on the DW735 thickness planer, that's a quarter of a crank for each 64th of an inch. The second thing I'll do is scrape down both faces with a wide sharp putty knife to remove any little smudges of glue and sawdust that might be on there because if there's a lump on the surface it's going to throw off how much gets planed off the opposite face. As you can see there's not much on there but then again it wouldn't take much to throw something off by a 64th of an inch. Once all the faces are scraped clean to my satisfaction the third step is to use a soft carpenter's pencil and use light squiggle marks to cover both faces of each of the pieces to make it easier for keeping track of everything in the planing steps that follow. I use the same sequence as before for planing these faces where I start by lowering the crank handle until the feed rollers and cutter head engage so I know that I'm in the right range for the finished thickness of these pieces. Then I rotate the handle to the 12 o'clock position which I know on this planer means it's 1 64th inch less than the thickness setting on the vertical gauge. Now that I'm certain of the thickness setting, I run each of the pieces through at this setting and then flip them top for bottom and for end, turn the crank another quarter of a turn, and run each of the pieces through on the other face so that they're all perfectly flat, smooth, and clean. Even though these boards are wide, I'm taking such a light pass that I can run the machine in the number two position with no detrimental effect on the finish of the finished pieces. If you're impressed by the performance of this machine on this kind of an operation, keep in mind that I keep this machine well fed and well cared for by waxing the platen and making sure all the bearings and rollers are in tip top shape because I both expect and need peak performance out of the machine on a project like this. And that really is all it takes to get a perfect match for thickness between the solid wood sides and the plywood ends on these tool totes. Matching that thickness is an important step for the sides of the tool totes whether or not they're laminated or just one solid piece. But this next step is specific to these laminations for this tool tote design because the bottom strip needs to be the exact same width as that center strip at an inch and seven eighths. So I need to trim these pieces so that bottom strip is the exact width because if you recall I didn't plane those at the same time. I wanted to leave this wider so that I didn't have to use clamping calls during glue up and this step We'll remove little marks in the edge of this that were left by the clamps and also true it up to precisely the right width. There's probably a better way to go about this, but I just want to get it done. So here's what I came up with. I cut a little piece off a center strip so I have a sample of the exact width that this piece and this piece need to be. And I cut a piece of quarter inch melamine to exactly seven inches wide. That's just an arbitrary number. And then I'm using this little sample please next to this and leaving just a skosh in here like a 32nd of an inch. Now I can take one of the side pieces and lay that piece of quarter inch MDF on it and line up the MDF with the exact glue joint right here. Then I loosely clamp it down with squeeze clamps, tap it into the exact position and then tighten up the squeeze clamp to hold the MDF in place along the glue joint. Once the MDF is precisely where I want it, I use a magnetic tack hammer to tack a number 19 by half inch nail through the MDF into scrap at the ends of the workpiece to maintain this perfect alignment. Then I can take the workpiece and straight edge back to the table saw and trim the bottom edge perfectly parallel to the glue joint. After making the cut, you can see that that bottom strip is still just a skosh wider than the exact width I need to end up with. So I'll put a mark that shows the excess width and carefully trim it off the joiner. Now that bottom strip is precisely the right width at an inch and seven eighths for three lugs of the box jointed corners. As it turns out, that wasn't so bad after all. With that step out of the way, all the pieces are the right thickness and the bottom two strips are the right width. Uh, the top is a little variation, but that doesn't matter. But that makes the next step cutting these pieces to their final length, which is going to be 24 and an eighth inches for a 24 inch tool tote 
with a sixteenth inch of extra material on each end to sand away once the corners are glued up. So I made one piece as a pattern and I use that to kind of select the best part of the grain on these pieces. Back and forth there's a little extra room. And so I just kind of lay this out and I mark them so I trim a little off the good end which leaves more to trim off the less desirable end. A process that yields the best looking pieces for the final project. So I can set about trimming them with this Osborne EB3 miter fence setup. Once all the pieces are selected and marked, I trim off the good end pretty close to the pencil mark I just made. Once the good end is trimmed clean and square, I use the pattern to double check the rib fence setting so I can use the same setting and the same setup to trim the other five blanks so they all come out precisely the same length. This setup and setting provides more consistent results than any method that involves measuring and marking pieces individually. And if I didn't know better, I might be inclined to think that this was a solid piece instead of six individual tool tote sides. With that bit of advanced millwork taken care of, I'm going to jump back into joinery mode and get set up to do the box or finger joints on the corners of all these tool totes. And getting that set up is a little bit tricky, but I'm just going to dive in and make it happen. In the spirit of Albert Einstein who said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. I'll show you the setup I use for making box joints. And anyone who spent time surfing YouTube knows there's dozens of box joint videos out there with all sorts of different setups and jigs and fixtures for making them. And I want to say the setup I use is stupid simple, but really I think it's smart simple. And the first feature is a very important feature and it's all about setup of a dado blade for making the box joint notches. I mentioned this stack of gauge blocks so often in this video it's becoming annoying, but this step is another prime example of how important these blocks are and how useful they are to maintain consistency and accuracy throughout the build because I use them here to set the dado blade for cutting a slot that's the exact width of this block as well as the exact height or depth of those notches. Proper setup and use of a dado blade is involved enough to warrant a whole video just on that topic alone, but suffice it to say that I have this blade set up with a number of shims in there so that the blade will cut a slot that's the exact width of this little block. And naturally the blade is raised to a height where the teeth are even with the top of this block so that the notches are the right depth. And the way I determine that everything is set up right is to cut a sample notch in a scrap of wood and test the fit of the little gauge block. And this is what a good fit looks like. The block fits in the slot with just enough friction to hold it in place, but not hold it very tightly. And the block is perfectly flush with the bottom of the scrap, meaning the blade height is set for the correct depth of a notch. Be prepared to spend a little bit of time getting that dado blade set up just so because it's really important for the success of the whole step. And I admit I'm not the luckiest guy in the world and it took me more than a few tries to get the width of that dado set up just how I want it and it involved adding and removing shims of two thousandths of an inch, four thousandths of an inch, etc. to get that dialed in so that the blade width matched these blocks exactly. And the trip down this rabbit trail is mostly necessary because I added this strip of a consistent width in an exact place on the sides and I want the joinery for the box joints to line up perfectly with those strips. If your box width is just solid wood, you can just make box joints that fit nice and if the side of the box doesn't come out exactly six and seven eighths, if it's a little less or a little more, everything still works. And if you're not concerned about an even notch and tab or notch and pin at the top of the box and the bottom, then much of what I'm showing you here is going to be overkill. You can just set up a regular box joint jig, cut some joints, stick the box together, and it's all good to go. But I also admit that I painted myself into a bit of a corner with this design, but I'm happy to tell you that the steps I'm going to show you do make it possible to make box joints of a precise height and a consistent height in case that's important to whatever project you've designed and are building. But getting back on track, once the dado blade is set up, I'm going to use just a piece of scrap material for an auxiliary fence or a backup fence. And I think the part that makes this setup simpler is that I'm not building a whole sled or a jig or a fixture or a box to get this done. It's just a couple of scraps of wood for this setup. With all that said, uh, this piece is about five inches wide and a couple feet long, which is accurate enough for this project and that has to do with 
uh, the width of these sides and the configuration of the, the tool tote ends. They have to fit in this jig and not bump into anything. And so with those parameters, uh, I'm just setting the fence at exactly nine inches. Let me get my click readers for this. And I lock that in place. And again, that's just kind of an arbitrary number, but I want an even number. And then this uh, piece of wood gets attached to a simple miter guide for the table saw. And it goes without saying that this piece needs to be straight and flat. And with those things dialed in, I just run a couple of inch and a half square drive screws through the back of my miter guide and into that block to hold it securely in place during this operation. Once the auxiliary fence is attached to the miter guide, I put a generous coating of paste wax on all the moving parts so that it slides freely and smoothly in use. Just like that. The next step for this setup is to take another piece of material, in this case I'm just using a scrap of half inch plywood that's the same size as the auxiliary fence or the backup fence on the miter guide. And this piece becomes a key component for the function of this simple jig. To set it up properly, I just put it against the auxiliary fence and most importantly, take two of my little gauge blocks and put them up against the fence and slide this piece over until it contacts those with just enough pressure to hold them in place. Once the piece is in position with those two little gauge blocks, I use a clamp to hold it firmly in place. And with everything set up just so, it's time to make the most important cut in this setup. It's important, but it's simple, and all I need to do is run the dado blade for a nice clean notch in these two pieces. And because of the mindful sequence used to get to this point, I'm confident that the gauge block will slide through that little notch, snugly but freely. And you'll soon see how and why that's important. When this fixture is in use, this piece gets slid over next to the fence and one of these blocks serves as an indexing pin for setting the spacing on the notches for the box joint. So it needs to be held firmly in place in that notch. And making it so is surprisingly easy. The best way I know to attach the little block is also the simplest. I start by spritzing the end of the gauge block with Starbond Accelerator and then spread a little medium CA on the three sides of the notch. Then, using the rip fence as a backstop, I slide the notched piece down over the gauge block, hold it for five seconds, and boom, it's done. And I can circle back to our buddy Albert, who I think would agree that that's just about as simple as possible, but no simpler. Now with that peg firmly in place, you can see what happens when I place this second piece of scrap in front of the auxiliary fence, with the two gauge blocks removed from the fence end of the block. The peg is perfectly positioned one gauge block away from the edge of the dado blade, just like it needs to be, but without a bunch of unnecessary fussing and figuring for an accurate and functional setup. At this point in the setup process, the next step is to clamp the two fence pieces together and make a second notch through the front piece that lines up with the first notch in the back piece. And if you do everything right to this point, this is what the setup should look like, where the space between the peg and the notch is exactly the width of one of the gauge blocks used for this setup from the get-go. And now it's time to give this whole setup a test run using a couple pieces of S-crap to make sure everything is set up as accurately and reliably as necessary before committing to cutting the box joints on actual pieces of the tool totes that have so much time invested into them that I really don't want to screw them up. Notching the first test piece is merely a matter of sliding the workpiece over next to the indexing pin and plowing a dado through it. Successive notches are made by placing the previous notch over the indexing pin and letting the dado blade do its work. And with everything set up right, the notching process is quick and clean. Because notches and pins need to alternate on opposite sides of a box joint, I place a gauge block next to the indexing pin and slide the workpiece over to touch that gauge block. Then I clamp the workpiece in place, remove the gauge block, and notch out the corner of this second test piece. With the corner notched out, I register the side of the first pin against the indexing block, and then repeat the process until there's no more block to notch. At first glance, that does look like a pretty sweet fit, but if you look a little closer, you can see that there's a bit of movement in the two pieces, which in some cases probably isn't that big of a deal. But on further inspection, you can see that the pegs are losing ground when compared to the gauge blocks that are the benchmark for layout of the tool tote project. And I fully agree that that really doesn't look like much, but it's enough to make a difference when the test block is placed on one of the side pieces for the tool tote, and you can see that the notches don't line up with the accent stripe like it needs to on the finished tool tote. 
I admit that if it wasn't for that darn stripe on the side of those toolboxes, this fit would probably be just fine. And it's probably more than acceptable for drawers or other projects where precise spacing of the pins and notches isn't so critical. But I kind of painted myself into a corner with the project. I need to make an adjustment to the jig to correct for that slight loss of spacing on the box joint pins and sockets. And luckily, that's not all that difficult to do with this fixture. At this point, it's important to note that the notch is the right size for those gauge blocks that I've been using as a reference since the beginning of a video. So any problem with the fit, any loss of height, has got to do with the width of the peg itself. And so the adjustment needs to address that and doesn't have anything to do with adjusting the width of the dado blade because it's spot on where it needs to be. And I'll verify that by measuring a notch on the sample piece. But you can see that that measurement is a little loose on the pins. And when I adjust for that, you can see that they're a 64th of an inch undersized. And because the width of the pins is ultimately set by the distance between the dado blade and the register block, that's where the adjustment needs to be made. So in effect, all I need to do is slide the register block over 1 64th of an inch, and I'll be golden. All I need to do to effect the change is to move the rip fence over a 64th of an inch, unclamp the register block, slide it over till it hits the fence, and clamp it in place to hold that adjustment of 1 64th of an inch. You can barely see that minute space in between the auxiliary fence and the rip fence, but it's there. But because the adjustment is so slight, I draw a square mark across the top edges of the blocks before releasing the clamp and making the adjustment as a double check of how much I'm actually moving it. Because making an adjustment that small is pretty unrealistic to measure. And even at that, the adjustment is almost imperceptible. The adjustment is so small as to be nearly imperceptible but now I'm ready for another test run of the fixture with two fresh pieces of S-Crap. I start out with a sample piece for the side that measures six and seven eighths of an inch. After completing the five notches in the side piece, I use the first lug on the bottom of the side piece to register the piece for the end and notch out the bottom corner quick and clean. Now that corner notch serves as a reference for the other five notches as I test cut the joint in the piece that represents the end of the tool tote. And you can see the difference in the fit of these pieces after making that nearly imperceptible change. That's a nice smooth fit. There's the slightest bit of movement there, but that's just enough to keep the veneers from chipping. And the joint is plenty snug enough for glue up. And you can see that the pins protrude by the 16th of an inch I planned for, so that can get trimmed up after glue up. And it's kind of remarkable that such a small change makes such a big difference. Especially when I compare to the first piece I made with the setup, because you can barely, barely see the difference right there. The most important way to see the effect of that small change in the box joint jig is by comparing alignment of the pins on the first sample piece on the side of the toolbox where the pins don't quite line up with the maple strip. And by comparison, pins on the piece made after the adjustment line up perfectly. But even that little difference is enough to make all the difference in the way the joinery comes together on the tool tote. And as a final confirmation, I can measure from the top of the top pin to the bottom of the piece and come up with exactly six and seven eighths, which is also an exact match to the stack up blocks that I've been using as a benchmark from early on in the project. Now that everything's all good and looking like it should, I run a couple square drive screws through the back fence into the front fence to hold everything in place so that I can remove the clamps, confident that the jig will stay set just like it is. As I cut box joints on the precious pieces of the tool tote, confident that they won't be spoiled in the process. Once the drama and anxiety of building the box joint fixture and dialing it in is over, actually cutting the box joints is routine. As with the test pieces, I start with the tool tote sides first, carefully registering the bottom edge of the side against the indexing pin to make the first notch, and the rest of the notches follow suit. I'm careful to use a steady feed rate so the dado blade can do its work without excessive chipping or burning as I make these cuts. Note that the top notch on the sides is incomplete, and that's because I left these pieces with extra width that will be trimmed off a little later in an upcoming step. 
Once the notches are cut in both ends of all the sides, I place one of the side pieces over the indexing pin and clamp it in place to cut the corner notches on all the tool tote ends with the same setup. After the corner notches are made, I unclamp and remove the side and proceed with the rest of the notches on both sides of the tool tote ends. And at the risk of boasting, I'm going to say that that is a mighty fine fit. The joint's not so tight that it'll get damaged while handling, and the pins protrude just the right amount for sanding flush after glue up. And as you'd expect, the joint on the inside is tight and nearly invisible. And another thing I can tell you is that as good as it feels to be at this stage in the build in the video, it's that much more rewarding when you're at this stage in the actual tool toad build because this is when you get your first real look at what all the time and effort involved at getting to this stage gets you. And to me, it's motivation to press on and finish up the build. I need to take care of one more detail before decommissioning this box joint fixture, and that is to re-notch the center stripe on the sides. And the reason I need to do that is to deal with the fact that this pin is light and the rest of them are dark. I want that pin to be dark for a continuous look on the end of the tool tote. And to accomplish that, I decided to re-notch this center stripe to include a little dark accent colored lug in there. So the side will look like this, and the ends of all the pins will be consistent looking at the tool tote from the end. Admittedly, it's kind of an OCD thing, but it's pretty simple to do while this fixture is still in place. I just need to make a couple of adjustments so that I can make all 12 of those notches quick, clean, and accurate. Because I'll be turning a pin into a notch, the indexing pin needs to be slid over exactly the width of one pin, which I can do by sliding this over and putting one of the little gauge blocks between the end of the jig and the fence. And the effect of that is that the dado blade is now lined up with a pin instead of a notch. Once the lateral adjustment is made, I use a small clamp to hold everything in position and then pilot and drill a couple screws to keep things from moving while making this last critical notch. With the position for this notch set, I raise the dado blade to set the overall depth of the notch and hold that height setting with a twist of a knob to lock it in place. So that re-notching the center of the stripe, turning it from a peg to a deeper notch, is quick, clean, consistent, and easy. And those two quick cuts are all it takes to add this little OCD design feature to the tool totes. Now here's what the tool tote looks like, all put together with those teeth knocked out of its corners. And as a standalone project, cutting the sweeping arcs, and as a standalone project, cutting the sweeping arcs in the sides of the tool tote like you can see in the side view plan drawing here, might seem a bit challenging, but considering everything we've tackled on the build so far, this step is, well, meh. It's no surprise that I use a template along with a drill press, band saw, and router lift for flush trimming to get the job done. I understand that some of you might be starting to yawn with the repetition at this stage of the video, but I wanna walk through the steps for laying out and creating the template in case others want it for guidance and reassurance. I start with a piece of quarter inch MDF faced with white melamine that needs to be a few inches wide and at least as long as the toolbox. The plan calls for the total length of this sweeping notch to be 16 inches. So I mark the center of the scrap and then put a mark eight inches either side of that center mark and square those marks across the template piece. Next, I draw a line an arbitrary half inch down from the top edge of the template piece from one end of the template to the other. This line mainly serves to make the template layout process a little easier. Next, I use a compass set at 3 8 of an inch to mark the center for a circle in 3 8 of an inch from the outer points and then use that circle center to draw a circle with a 3 quarter inch diameter at each of those points. Once the circles are drawn, I extend lines to their center points and draw another line parallel to the edge of the template piece that's tangent with the bottom edge of those two circles. And this line just serves as another guideline while laying out the arcs and curves for the template. Now I put a mark another 3 8 of an inch down from that guideline on the center line to lay out the 3 8 inch sweep of this arc. Next, with those points established, I use a hammer and a scratch awl to imprint the intersecting lines. The hammer and scratch awl are just a pro tip that make it a little easier to start the three nails for setting up the arc stick because it breaks through the tough melamine crust on this template. 
and then drive a small nail in each of those three points to set up arc sticks for drawing this arc in the same fashion as I did while drawing the sweeping arc of the tool totes handle. Now, as before, I used spec tape on one of two different arc sticks to hold them together at the apex to draw this arc in similar fashion as before after removing the nail from the center point on the template. Now it's over to the drill press, but with a three quarter inch bit this time to drill arcs for rounded ends of this curve. The next step is a stop at the table saw to rip the template along the center line of those circles before heading over to the band saw to carefully cut the long sweeping arc for this template. And I finish up with a few licks using 80 grit sandpaper on the custom curved sanding block I just made at the bandsaw to quickly fine tune the sweeping arc of this curve. The trickiest part is the tangent point between the little arc on the end and the sweeping arc in the middle. So pay a little extra attention there if necessary so there's not a little difficulty in what should be a smooth transition from one arc to the other. And that alarm is just for anyone who actually did fall asleep while I was laying out and cutting this template because I thought you might want to be awake to actually see it in use cutting the sides of the tool totes. There is one minor bit of housekeeping that I need to take care of before cutting the sweep in the tool tote sides and that is if you remember I left the sides extra wide here during fabrication and that needs to be trimmed off so the tool tote sides are at their finished height and fit nicely in the box joints where the sides meet the ends. Ultimately, the height of the sides needs to exactly equal the combined height of box joint segments at 6 and 7 8 inches. So I just rip the sides a scope strong and then carefully joint the edge to clean it up. Pay extra attention here because if you make the side piece too narrow, the top pin will be too short to fill the top notch. So err on the side of too wide rather than too narrow because it can be shaved slightly later for a perfect fit. When the sides are at finished width, I draw a mark at the center of the top edge and after adding a couple strips of spec tape, use the rip fence to help align center marks and stick the template to the workpiece. Then I clamp a strip of S-crap to the top edge of the side and, using the template as a drill guide as I did before on the handle, drill three quarter inch holes to create the small radii at each end of the side. Now I can rough cut the arc on the band saw, leaving a small margin to the template and taking extra care so I don't damage the template in the process. The final step to finish the cutout on the top edges of the tool tote sides is to flush trim the sweeping arc to match the template using that half inch flush trim bit in the Powerlift Pro router lift. Because the template is flush with the workpiece on both ends, no starter pin is necessary for this flush trimming step. So I just used the app to raise the bit to a preset position and then fire it up to quickly flush trim this walnut tool tote side. And that's all it takes to perfectly fair the curve. So I can use a putty knife to release the template from this tool tote side. Here again, it takes a lot of time to explain and demonstrate these steps in this sequence, but the work itself is really quite quick and straightforward. Naturally, your workflow will be different if you're using other tools. For instance, if you don't have a drill press and are using a jigsaw, you'll probably just trace the template initially and only stick it to the workpiece for the flush trimming step at the end. With all the curved edge notches complete, it's time to add a thumbnail profile to finished edges of the sides, ends, and handle. And in my thinking, a thumbnail edge is a classy alternative to a full bullnose profile, even though it's created in virtually the same way with a roundover router bit. Normally, I'd use a roundover bit half the thickness of the workpiece to route a bullnose profile. So for the half inch thick sides and ends, I'd use a roundover bit with a quarter inch radius and route from both faces for a full half inch bullnose edge profile. On the other hand, to create a classy thumbnail profile, the only difference is that I choose a roundover bit with a larger radius. I like to use a roundover bit with a 3 8 inch radius for a distinct but subtle profile on half inch thick material like the sides and ends of this tool tote. So to set up for the thumbnail profile, I use the app to raise the collet into bit change mode, then remove the half inch flush trim bit and chuck up the 3 8 inch roundover bit and then raise the bit so the bottom edge of the bearing is set just slightly more than half the thickness of one of the side pieces. Because there's space between the bearing and the cutter, I test the adjustment on a piece of scrap material the same thickness as the sides and make slight adjustments if necessary so I don't over or undercut the edge. I make a couple minor adjustments of mere fractions of an inch up and down 
until I've got the thumbnail profile just right on the scrap of material from one of the sides. Once bit height is set, I carefully start routing the cutout edge on the top of the sides. Since I only want the thumbnail profile on the curved section, I use a starting pin on the router lift to approach the cut. Be aware that the bit really wants to cause splinters where the router bit exits the cut, so go slow to prevent it, even if it results in a little scorching of the wood, because it's easier to sand out a burn than to replace splinters. Because there's a small gap between the pilot bit and the actual roundover cutter, the thumbnail profile is off just a little bit after one pass on each face. So I like to flip the workpiece over and run a second pass on the first face to remove just a whisker of wood and make the thumbnail profile symmetrical on the edge of the piece. And I don't know about you, but I sure like the look of a subtle thumbnail profile on an edge like this compared to a full bull nose or just a small roundover radius along the sweeping curve on the top edge of the tool tote sides. And it's just as simple as that to create a subtle thumbnail profile on the sides of your tool tote for an edge that is smooth to the touch and easy on the eyes, in my humble opinion. Once all the sides are done, and because they're the same thickness, I can use the same router setup and add that sweet thumbnail profile to the end of the tool tote. While adding the thumbnail profile to the end, I need to take care of all starting and stopping so I don't overcut and damage the top pin on the ends. It's easy enough to avoid as long as you're paying attention. You can see the huge benefit of a starter pin because it gives me complete control while starting the cut at exactly the right position on the top of the side piece, even though it's not needed when I finish up the profile at the opposite end because I pull the work piece safely away without damaging the next pin. As with the side pieces, I take three passes on the ends doubling up on the side with the first pass so that the profile is symmetrical on the edges. And as long as we're in roundover mode, let's refine the handles in the same manner. But since the handles are thicker, I'll switch to a larger roundover bit. And a 5 8 inch radius roundover bit is my choice for this operation. I go through the same gears to get this larger bit set up in the router lift. I start with a rather arbitrary and random height setting for the first pass on all the edges of both faces of the handles. I make sure to take extra care while starting and stopping these cuts as well so as not to damage tenons on the ends of the handles. Since the bit is much larger and removing more material, I route the profile in three passes, raising the bit for each pass to sneak up on the final shape. After running the initial thumbnail profile pass on all the edges of all three handles, I use the app to raise the bit another sixteenth of an inch for a second pass as I sneak up on the finished thumbnail profile for the handles. After completing the second pass on all three handles, I bump the bit up another 32nd of an inch and do a test section on one of the handles to finish sneaking up on the final height setting for the bit to complete the thumbnail profile that I'm after. I decide to bump up the bit height one more time to complete the thumbnail profile and like I did on the half inch thick pieces, I take three passes to complete the profile to account for the small space between the guide bearing and the actual cutter on the router bit so that the thumbnail profile is clean, smooth, and symmetrical for the full length of the handle on both the inside and outside of the curve. And once I'm satisfied with the height setting of the bit, I run the profile on the other two handles in the same three pass sequence to finish up with this operation. And I think that thumbnail profile makes for a pretty sweet look at a handle, but to make the handle feel as good as it looks, I'm going to take one more step to ease the edges around the handle itself for a super comfortable grip because after all I'm the one that's going to be carrying this toolbox around and to get that done I'm going to switch to a half inch roundover bit and create a full bullnose profile just on the handle section of the handle to give it the best of both worlds for aesthetics and comfort. And by now you know the drill for how to do this. 
All I need to do is remove the insert, raise the collet to bit change height, swap out the 5 8 radius for the half inch radius, lock the whole insert back into place, and adjust the height of the bit so that the half inch round over is tangent to the router lift's top, so it'll cut a full bullnose profile on these sections of the handles. And if you look real close, you can see that the bit setting is a little bit high because the edge of the round over bit makes a line on the face of the handle. So I'll adjust for that by lowering the bit just 5 thousandths of an inch before I route the remaining handles to save time sanding those other handles later. And that completed bullnose profile makes for a super comfortable pistol grip for the tool tote handles. When all the thumbnail edge profiling is done, you can dry fit your tool tote again for an inspirational look at what you're creating. And personally, I'm liking what I'm seeing at this stage of the build. Except for the fact that this is the point in the video when I discovered that the one and three quarter inch handle width and the position of the tenons on the ends left corners of the mortises exposed and I had a back pedal to correct the problem by making three new handles two inches wide with lowered tenons to get myself out of the predicament. As if making three new handles wasn't bad enough, I also had a remodel of video production so viewers would avoid the disheartening feeling I got when the handle width problem smacked me right in the not so funny bone. But oh well, Poe Buddy's nerfed and I hope this whole situation encourages you to press on and complete projects even when deal breaking situations like this come up on challenging projects you're building whether or not it's tool totes like these. Although these parts are technically ready for sanding and assembly, I'm going to take a detour here to embellish them with a laser engraver to add next level carpentry branding to the accent stripe on the side and the end panels for a custom next level carpentry touch to the project. I'm sure it's hard to believe, but truth be told, it's been nine months since I shot video for this production. That's because after deciding to do the branding slash engraving on these tool totes in house, rather than farming it out like I did on my master carpenter's footstool build, I went on an unbelievably circuitous journey to get a laser capable of doing the engraving and then learning how to use it proficiently enough to get the results I want without spoiling pieces of the tool totes that I've invested so much time in making. Crazy it took nine months, but at long last, I can show how my 55 watt CO2 laser from Xtool gets professional results engraving next level carpentry text on the side of the tool totes and my actual signature on the ends. I'll start by engraving this next level carpentry text in the accent banner strip on the side pieces because it's simpler than engraving my actual signature on the ends. And even though this step is pretty straightforward, if you want to know more about what's actually involved in a high stakes engraving process like this, check out the Xtool P2 Laser unboxing and review video I did a couple months ago. That video will also give you an idea of why it took nine months for this old nail bender to enter the CNC laser paradigm and build the confidence necessary to engrave these priceless pieces without spoiling them in the process. Using knowledge gained from the lasered louver video linked here that I did a couple weeks ago, I made this precision positioning piece that fits inside the laser compartment and helps me to avoid making irreversible mistakes during the laser engraving process. And I made this positioning strip so that when one end is up against the left side of the laser compartment and one edge is against the front of the compartment, the other edge is at exactly Y equals eight inches and there's a line scored at exactly X equals 10 inches. With the positioning piece in place, I can use its properties to line up a tool tote side inside the laser compartment by putting the bottom edge of the side against the top edge of the strip and aligning a mark that's 10 inches from the end of the tool tote side with the mark that's scored at exactly X equals 10 inches. So the strip not only makes the piece parallel to the gantry inside the laser, it also positions it side to side for locating the text. And starting with a known position of Y equals eight inches, the text will be engraved on the accent strip with the bottom edge of the strip at X equals six and an eighth inches and the top edge of the strip at X equals four and a quarter inches. And the text will come out centered up from side to side on the piece and centered up on the stripe with no more trouble than that. 
Once the tool tote side is in place, I close the lid of the P2 laser and let the internal cameras capture an image of the piece in place and superimpose the next level carpentry text onto that image that represents where the text will be engraved on the side. If you look closely at the image captured by the P2, there appears to be a misalignment between the scored line and the pencil line on the tool tote. And that apparent misalignment is the whole reason I use this positioning piece because I know the pieces are actually lined up perfectly, but parallax from the cameras creates the appearance of misalignment, even though it doesn't exist in the software. So I rely on the positioning piece rather than the camera image to position the text on this piece. I'm gonna geek out a bit here with terminology to explain the laser engraving process you're about to see. In this particular laser file, I've got two layers. One is a blue layer, which is set to ignore, and that's just a reference rectangle that helps me verify the position of the text on the piece in relation to the positioning piece down here. You can see that the box on the blue layer is positioned at x equals zero, and it's 10 inches wide, and that's how I verify the location of this x equals 10 inch mark. That blue layer is set to ignore because it's not part of the engraving process. All the engraving is done on the red layer, which as you can see is a bitmap image, which is different than a vector image, but that's a whole other topic. And you can see the settings over here for that red layer, that's a bitmap image. It's set to engrave, it's set as output, so it will engrave. And there's a manual setting for the engraving itself which I've got at a full 100% of the 55 watt laser power and a speed of 150 millimeters a second. I'm using a Jarvis bitmap mode, which I don't really understand, but it's engraving at 100 lines per centimeter. And I'm using these settings so that I get a nice, rich, deep engraving of the text on that hard maple strip. And I apologize for the bad audio in this segment here because the exhaust fan in the laser generates white noise that kind of mutes out the audio and it only gets worse when the exhaust fan is going during the laser engraving process. But I wanted to give you an idea of what's involved in setting up a piece like this. As I said earlier, I've got a ton of time invested in making these tool tote sides, and I wanna make sure I get everything right because once that laser starts burning, it's either all right or it's all wrong. And even with all this dialogue, I still am cutting a bunch of corners because creating the file so that that next level carpentry text looks like I want it to, uh, not like some of these other images that I worked on. I had to work on this next level carpentry text to get it to behave the way I want it to. And a number of these attempts are my attempts to use the Creative Space software that comes with the Xtool P2 laser. And as it turns out, the Creative Space software is functional and it's accurate, but it's not as robust as Lightburn. And to get this text to look just the way I want it, I had to reach out to my friend Derek Lacey, who is a bit of a ninja with uh, Lightburn software, and he helped create the bitmap file that I'll actually engrave on that piece because there's some geeky little details that Creative Space won't do, but Derek was able to use his version of Lightburn to create a file, email it to me in SVG format, which the Creative Space software understands, and then I imported that image into this machine and that tablet so that I could program the power and speed settings so that the engraving would come out the way I want it, which is exactly this. And once I'd gone through all these iterations here, I burnt the final iteration on an actual strip of the same maple that's on the tool toad side. And all those steps in combination with creating that positioning piece make me confident that I'll get the laser engraving I want on the piece that's now in the machine. So I can flip the switch or push the button or pull the trigger and finally engrave text on a tool tote side. And this is how the laser engraving process works. Once all the parameters are set in the Creative Space software, I touch the process button on the tablet screen. And once it generates an image of the engraving, then the software sends the file to the P2 laser to execute. The next step is to push the start button on the laser. And once I do that, the P2 jumps into action and starts scoring the next level carpentry text into the solid maple strip on the tool tote side. I'm running the first segment of this clip in real time so you can see what the 150 millimeters per second speed looks like. But because this is as boring as watching paint dry, I'll speed it up a bunch while the laser finishes the job. If you remember, 
I set this engraving at 100 lines per centimeter, and because the height of this text is about three centimeters, that means the laser will take 150 passes back and forth to complete the burn, because this is also a bi-directional setting. So the laser is burning from left to right and right to left to cut the actual burn time in half. When the laser head is at the far end of its travel, you can see light of the burn taking place. And that light is wood burning from the heat of the laser beam, not the laser beam itself, because a CO2 laser beam is actually invisible. I don't know what the temperature of the laser beam is as it's burning the wood, but you might be able to see smoke wafting up as the laser etches that text. But the exhaust fan inside the laser compartment quickly sucks up those fumes and exhausts it through a pipe out the back window of my shop. The relatively slow speed of 150 millimeters per second makes the engraving process slow, but it's necessary to get a good deep burn of this text so it won't be compromised when I sand the tool toad and finish it and so it won't fade over time from wear. The time clock is at 12 minutes and counting as the laser completes the bottom lines of the text and retreats to its parking place at X0 equals Y0 after a total of 13 minutes and 20 seconds for the burn. And once smoke is evacuated out of the cabinet, the lid unlocks so I can open it to reveal the results of the engraving. And I can finally breathe a sigh of relief now that the engraving is done. It's lined up perfectly in the banner strip and the text is centered at exactly 7 16 of an inch from both the top and the bottom of that strip. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of a journey nine months long that I took to engrave that text in this tool toad side. So I'm sure you can imagine my sense of relief and accomplishment at getting to this point in the build. Now that the banner text is engraved on the sides of the tool totes, it's time to engrave my actual signature on the ends. And as I said earlier, doing the text on the side is simpler and I'll explain why now. The first complication is that the end of the tool tote physically won't fit within the laser engraving compartment in an upright orientation. And although that's not a deal breaker, it is a complication because when I place this piece of cardboard in the laser engraving compartment, you can see where the laser work area is. This is the main work area that's 600 millimeters by 305 millimeters. And although this piece will fit in here, the engraving process, which takes place going back and forth like this, takes a lot longer because of the number of lines it has to engrave. So it's another complication compared to the fact that if this piece would fit in this direction, it could engrave like this, the whole thing would be simple. And I would do the engraving in the same manner as I did on the side panels, even though the graphic or text is different. And because I'm neither the first or the last one to want to engrave something that's too big to fit in the compartment, I appreciate the feature of the X-Tool laser, which is called open slats mode and is used by removing the support slats from inside the laser compartment and lowering the tray underneath so that the workpiece can be positioned underneath the laser. No matter how long it is, it has a pass through that's virtually infinite. And with that feature, I can slip the piece in underneath here and engrave it side to side to reduce the engraving time and simplify the process. But switching the laser over to open slats mode is the main thing that makes engraving the ends more complicated than engraving the sides. X-Tool's solution for engraving oversized objects is the P2 riser base that lifts the machine and provides easy access to the space underneath for placing, engraving, scoring, and cutting oversized objects. As fate would have it, in a moment of unanticipated serendipity, X-Tool sent a riser base for my P2 laser that arrived on my doorstep just in time for this segment of the Master Carpenter Tool Tote build video. Like all X-Tool products, the P2 riser base comes in a well padded box, so I didn't find any damage from shipping on any of the parts as I laid them out on my bench. But I did have to search for the little packet of screws and screwdriver for assembly. The instruction booklet is virtually language free and proud, but since a picture is worth a thousand words, it's just as well. So I just review the collection of pieces parts and get started assembling the left structure. First, I attach left corner pieces to the left side panel with two screws for each corner, starting them by hand to avoid cross-threading 
and then tightening them lightly with an impact driver to lock them in place. Next, I attach the leg support block to the left panel with two screws and then attach the left panel to the left structure assembly with six screws using the same starting and tightening steps as before. The right side structure is next. Because the end panel on this side is hinged, I first attach the spreader bar to one corner, slip the door pivot pins into both corners, and then drive two screws in the opposite end of the spreader bar to hold the hinge door into place. This side gets a leg support block too, so I attach it and finish this side by attaching the right panel to the right structure with six of the flathead screws provided just like I did for the left structure. The next step is to connect the two side structures. It's important to note that the front panel is slightly wider slash taller than the rear panel, so I place them accordingly with pivot pins in the sockets provided in the corner pieces before dropping the spreader bars into place. With everything in place, I start and drive the four flathead screws that hold the bottom of the assembly together. The last step is to install the top tray, which is held in place with four cylindrical head screws through slotted holes that complete the assembly process. The completed base has a respectable fit, finish, and function, and is plenty strong enough to support the heavy laser, even though it doesn't have the refined, seamless fit I expected when the laser is set on top of it. And you'll see what I mean by this in a bit. Next, I use a chain hoist hanging from the skyhook in my shop to raise the P2 laser off the custom cart I built and wheel the cart out from under it. Now I add two pieces of aluminum angle to the top of the cart to locate the riser base and keep it from shifting. Then lift the riser and set it in position, relying on gravity to hold it there. After that, I raise the laser high enough to clear the riser and cart, wheel the cart into position, and then lower the laser onto the base. And there's nothing like having access to a real honest-to-goodness skyhook for a job like this, right? Once the laser is in position, I lower it onto the riser, remove lifting straps, protective foam sheet, and dust cover, then make a final adjustment to position the laser feet into sockets in the base. I'll remind you that the whole reason we headed down this rabbit trail is because this piece doesn't fit inside the laser compartment, but needs to be placed on the tray underneath the laser compartment in what's called open slats mode. And the first step in setting up open slat mode is to remove all the slats from inside the laser compartment. I already removed the slats while rehearsing for this segment of the video, but you can see what it looks like here, and that it's easy to lift them out of their slots. And as it turns out, there's a handy storage space behind the door on the right side of the riser base. Now I'll show you that setup for positioning this piece for engraving is the same thing, only different as the process I used before for engraving text on the side of the tool tote, with the main difference being I need to position the piece and orient it on the tray itself rather than in the laser compartment. But I'll start out with the same positioning piece just because I have it on hand and it works well as a guide for positioning that piece in open slats mode on the tray underneath. This is kind of a tricky camera angle but you can see what the laser bed looks like with all the slats removed and I'll just pull the tray out from underneath and you can see the full depth of the riser base here. Now I can put the positioning piece in place so you can see how it relates to this whole setup. And I can slide the tray back in place on the highest setting on the riser base below. And you can see the range of height settings here for the tray, which is now installed at position number one. And previously it was installed up here in the base of the laser itself. So I'm lowering it by that much. And the general idea is to position the tool tote end so that the center lines up with the X equals 10 inch mark and the bottom of the end piece lines up with the Y equals 8 inch mark here. And because this setup is so unique to this unique toolbox, I'm not going to go off into the weeds on how I made the fixture for this, but I will show you what it looks like over here. And here's what the tray looks like when it's out of the laser. And the process I'm using is somewhat similar to a fixture I used for the lasered louver video. So anybody that saw that, this will be a little more familiar. But again, the idea is to place the workpiece here above the tray and then hold it in orientation so that the, I can um, lay out the engraving where it needs to come out. And the way I did that was just to make a simple carrier here, a couple of strips with a rabbit in the top, and a notch in the bottom here so it drops over this front edge of this tray like that and can move back and forth. Simple enough 
and I can place the workpiece in between those slats and I've got positioning marks here so I know where to line it up. And I made a teeny wooden wedge to kind of hold it in place by just locking it in here on one of those tenons. So that holds the piece oriented this way, locks it in place this way, and then this whole thing can slide back and forth. And I deduced that a uh, scrap exactly three and five eighths inches wide dropped in here with this particular fixture holds this in position when I slide it up next to it. And that holds center mark of the tool tote end at exactly X equals 10 inches. And because I don't want this thing wiggling around, I just made a stick over here that holds all that in place. So that's what the tool tote end looks like when it's in the exact position where I need it for the engraving. And here's what it looks like when I slide the tray into position on top of the number one runners in there. Slides right into place. I've got the tray slid over to this side of the machine and it's parallel. I got a uh, keep it keep in mind because I can push this sideways like this. This tray will kind of turn sideways a little if I let it, but I just slide it in until it stops and that holds it in a perfect position. And with the slats out now, the laser head can come down and do the etching in here in the open slats mode. And I'll just show you this again. This is that positioning piece here. And this is really tough to get a view with the camera, but if I use my double square here, you can see that the edge of this piece lines up with the edge of this piece in three dimensional space like that. And then this line at X equals 10 inches lines up with the center of that piece there. So I know that everything is in the position it needs to be in for the engraving process. And here's what it looks like at the back of the machine. You can see the tool tote end up there sitting on the tray and it's not that long so it doesn't stick out the back of the machine. But you can see out the front door of the machine there and I can close the back door here to help contain the smoke during the burn. Now that everything's in place I'll go through a few more steps to get this set up for engraving and one of those steps is to close the front door there and I'll show you inside here on the workpiece and I hope you can see this there's a few faint pencil marks here I've got a center mark and then a left and a right boundary just done lightly in pencil so that when I take an image of this I can make sure that the positioning is what it's intended to be and that's just kind of like a analog double check to the digital setup system. Now that the laser's turned on you can hear that fan running which will mess with my audio but here on the screen of the tablet you can see the image of the signature on an image captured by the laser of the tool tote end that I just placed on the tray and because this is open plane mode, I've been calling it open slats mode, but it's open plane. Because it's in open plane mode, it's reminding me to remove the slats so that the laser head doesn't get damaged when it goes to engrave this. So I can shut that off because I've got it done. And I'll do a quick double check of the thickness of the material or this distance. This should be about right because this setup's the same as the last time I gave this a test run, but I'll show you what the process looks like when I use this function here. Take the cursor to the little box and then I select a spot out here where I want it to measure. And the auto distance function activates the GAN3 and the laser head as well as a laser beam to measure the distance down to a particular spot on the surface of the piece being engraved. So that it runs the laser head at the correct height for the focal length of the beam to engrave my signature on this piece of half inch Russian birch plywood. And you can see the properties I have for this engraving here. There's a red layer that set the score around the outside, but I'm just going to ignore that layer for this burn and use the engraving setting for this bitmap image, which is set to power at 100, 250 millimeters per second speed. This is Atkinson bit mode at 100 lines per centimeter. And down here it says bi-directional, which I mentioned before on a previous step. And that just means the laser is engraving going both directions to cut the engraving time in half. And if I zoom way in here on the engraving, you can see that my reference pencil mark lines up with the tail of the signature here. The one on the bottom lines up with the bottom of this little curly cue. And the pencil on the left lines up with, this, with the left side of the signature. And again, the little variation between the engraving and those reference lines is due to parallax in the camera. But those reference lines make sure that I haven't moved something by an even inch somewhere so that it would engrave in the wrong spot. But that's what the screen looks like when this project is ready to go. So I can initiate the engraving by touching the process button 
and the start button on the screen. And now at long last, I can hit the start button on the laser to begin the process of engraving a copy of my actual signature on the end piece of a master carpenter's tool tote. With this speed and power setting, the laser burns through the first layer of veneer, giving me a nice deep dark etching that'll really pop once the tool tote is sanded and given a few coats of Old Master's gel poly as a finish. And after waiting nine months, seven minutes, and 10 seconds for that burn time is a small price to pay. And I can finally pop open the door to take the cake out of the oven and see how it turned out. And that looks mm -mm good, if I do say so for myself. Oh yeah. I keep talking about the nine month long journey I went on to get to this point. And one thing I've learned on the journey is how much appreciation I have for the folks at Vanway Trophy that engraved the parts on my master carpenter footstools and putting my name on the tool totes that I built in the past. And even though this video is crazy long already, I wanna show you one more thing before I climb out of this rabbit hole. And that is to use a piece of scrap material here in the fixture. This is one of my test pieces. And I'll use that piece so that you can see the difference between the, the uh, engraving process that I use here and an alternative method, which is a scoring process. And that's significant because the engraving is done with a bitmap image with the laser going back and forth. And the scoring process is done with a vector image, which is actually tracing the outside of the letters. And personally, it's pretty cool to see. So I'm gonna get this set up in the laser and show you what I'm talking about. And because this is just a test run on a scrap as an example, positioning of the piece really isn't critical. I use the same file for this process, but I'll use a, a different layer. The engraving is on the blue layer, so I'll set that to ignore. And the scoring is on the red layer, so I'll set that to output, set the score here using the power of 75, speed of 150, and one pass to get this done. And the material thickness is already set, so that's good. And now you can see the difference between scoring and engraving, because this is just an inside and outside outline of my signature. And this is what that scoring process looks like in action. And the best thing about the scoring process is that the Creative Space software does all the thinking and it sets about doing the scoring all by its own self and doesn't quit until the job is done. And it's pretty remarkable that the runtime for scoring is under two minutes while the runtime for the engraving is over seven. And the end result is that the two signatures are identical in size and shape but completely different in appearance. And with that comparison complete, I can finally climb out of a rabbit hole and get off the detour and back on the road of building these carpenter's tool totes because these parts are ready for sanding and glue up. Finally. As much as I hate sanding, I'm actually looking forward to it on this project because it's been such a long time coming. But before I get started, I need to take care of one detail and that is to fill in the missing teeth on the corner of this box joint on each of the side pieces. And it's pretty simple and straightforward, but I'll cover it here just to make sure it's included in the video record. To make the missing teeth, I just cut pieces off a scrap of the side piece into little chunks that fit down into the mortise of that banner strip where I'll glue them in place. And it's super simple to glue those little blocks into place. I start by putting a piece of green frog tape on my worktop so I don't stick the side to the top in the process. Then I clamp a side piece down tight on top of that piece of tape. Next, I spritz the mortise with Starbond's accelerator and tap the snug fitting piece into place. Because these pieces are made from actual scrap of the side pieces, they're already the same thickness. So all I had to do was match the width for a snug fit. And I'll trim off the extra length of this little tooth later. Once the piece is tapped all the way in and down flush with the surface, I use Starbond's water thin CA glue to wick down into the joint and hold this tooth firmly in place. A spritz of accelerator in between applications assures me that the joint is completely filled and that all the CA that's seeped into the joint is cured. And once I'm satisfied that the joint on top is full, I flip the piece over and repeat the wicking process from the other side for a super strong glue joint. And once the joint is filled from both sides, I scrape away excess hardened CA glue with a sharp putty knife so the surface is flat for sanding. And once the excess glue is cleaned up, I check the fit of this finger joint on the corner of the Master Carpenter's Tool Tote 
and smile because now the ends of all the tendons show up dark when viewed from the end of the tool tote. And I could proceed with the rest of this dentistry work until all the missing teeth are replaced. Because I really hate sanding, I was sure glad when Chip showed up for the toolbox sandorama here at Next Level Carpentry because he could get that done while I stand here and talk about stuff. And as you can see, he's using a, it's a Bosch random orbit sander and using abrasive discs on that, which is no surprise. And I've got a range of discs here, um, starting with 80 grit, going up to 240. But because this wood is pretty smooth, uh, the first disc he's going with, the first grit is 120 grit. And that smooths out any rough spots or planar marks that are in there and kind of gets the surface all evened up. And then the other two grits, the 180 and the 240, are just to take out the scratches from the previous grit. And he finishes up with 320 grit hand sanding paper. And one thing I want to point out is that this is a shout out for Starbond, who is coming up with a premium line of sanding discs. They already have an economy line of sanding discs, and they've been going through the gears to develop a premium line. And these are a beta test version of that. And what makes them premium is that they have a special grit on them, which is sharper and lasts longer. They're on a really tough hook and loop back uh, backing for these discs. So they're sharp and they cut fast and they're tough so they last long. And those features combined mean less sanding for me or less sanding for Chip. So I'm really looking forward to when they release their special grit discs. I'm not sure if they'll be purple or not like these, but when they're released, I'll be showcasing them on Next Level Carpentry because it's a product I've really been pushing for. And the sanding process for all the parts on that tool tote are basically the same with the exception of the handle. And the faces of the handle get sanded with the sides, but then the top and bottom are a different process that gets done over in the bench habit. When it comes time to sand the handles, you're going to want to use a couple of Chip's pro tips here. And the first one is to clamp the handle in a bench habit to hold it firmly and use a rocking motion of that random orbit sander on the long curves on the top and bottom of the handle. And this makes quick work of smoothing up the routed edges of the Russian birch plywood that makes up the core of this handle. The next pro tip from Chip is to use a sharpened putty knife for removing the burn marks left by the roundover bit on the edge of this handle. This technique quickly scrapes away that burn without changing the profile or contour of the wood. Plus it's really quick and leaves a surface behind that's easily sanded smooth. The next pro tip is to use grit grip dual sided sandpaper for sanding the recessed area in the top of the handle. This is a product I received a while back from John Conboy to beta test on the Next Level Carpentry channel. And I really like this dual sided pad because it's put on a backer that's stiff yet flexible and the grit is nice and sharp. I use grit grip like normal sandpaper for the wide area of the handle recess and it holds its shape nicely when I bend it to follow the tighter curves on the recess in this handle. And I hope this shows up as well in the camera as it does in practice because it makes super quick work of sanding the awkward profiles and contours on this pistol grip full tote handle. And the only drawback is that John sent me only two grits, 120 grit and 400 grit for beta testing. So I've got to do the intermediate grit stage sanding with partially spent special grit discs from Starbond. But because the initial stages of sanding go quick and easy, it's also quick and easy to follow up with the finer grits through 320 grit to finish up initial sanding of these handles before glue up. And I can assure you that sanding the pistol grip portion of the handle works equally well with these techniques and products, but it's harder to capture on the camera. So I'll breeze over the bulk of the board on here. And now that sanding on the handle is complete, Chip can slip that toolbox back together in a initial dry fit before glue up. And I'll proceed by making wedges for the wedge tenons on the ends of the handles, which I need for glue up. But in the meantime, Chip, thanks for all the hard work and getting me out of all that boring and time consuming sanding. I really appreciate it. So have a great day. Excellent then. We'll catch you another time. Now it's time to make wee wooden wedges for the wedged tenons on the end of the handles so that they're ready during glue up. And as you might expect, I'm making those wedges with a contrasting wood for the end of the handle. So I'm using walnut for two of the tool totes and carry wood for the other ones. I need to make eight walnut wedges and four carry wedges. And although they're simple enough to make, it can be a little tricky to get them right. So let me show you how I make those little wedges. For the wedges to be strong when driven, the grain needs to run this direction. They'll pound in like this. 
So I'll make the wedges on the end of this skinny piece of scrap. This was leftover veneer from the handles. And time and experience tells me that a taper of three degrees over that 9 16 of an inch is just the right amount of pressure on these tenons to lock them into place during glue up. And because I need to make 12 of these wee wooden wedges that are exactly the same, I'll use the table saw. And keep in mind, my table saw is old and it's right tilt, so anybody with a left tilt table saw, everything gets reversed. But the setup and the process are the same. And the way the saw is set up is that the blade is set to about 5 eighths of an inch in height. The fence is set an eighth of an inch away from the blade. And the blade is tilted away from the fence at three degrees to make this cut. And you'll notice that I'm using a zero clearance throat plate here because that's the only way I can slide these little pieces past the blade without them getting sucked down into the table saw and making a mess. Time and experience have taught me that cutting small pieces like this on a table saw has the potential for disaster. So to make sure I can cut these pieces safely and accurately, plus get a good shot with the camera angle, I'm gonna make a special push block that ensures both safety and success. And that push block is super simple. I just got two scraps of this plywood and I wanna line it up so that there's a slight offset in the end of the pieces and I'll lock that setting into place with a screw. And this simple push block allows me to hold the piece firmly against the fence in a vertical position and push it smoothly past the spinning blade to cut a precise three degree bevel on each end of each piece I'm making wedges out of. And a quick test fit shows me I got that taper and width dialed in exactly where it needs to be. The blank starts into the slot but quickly tightens so I know the taper will tighten the fit of the tenon when the wedge is driven in during glue up. Once I've got bevels cut on the ends of enough pieces for all the wee wedges, I switch the table saw setup and trim the tapered pieces off the ends of the wedge blanks. After all the wedge blank strips are made, the next step is to cut them into pieces that are as long as these tenons are wide. And it's at times like this when safety comes forefront in my mind at the end of a project that's super involved, a lot of steps, a lot of different pieces. Now all I've got to do is make these little wedges, piece of cake, right? but they're small, they need to be accurate, they need to be cut. And the temptation is to just take that little piece and cut it on the miter saw or something and do something that's just quick to get it over with. But this is the time when situational awareness is most important and you gotta keep your focus. What I try to do in my mind is to think through it like this is the only job I have to do today. How do I do this safely and accurately? So with those thoughts in mind, I'll show you how I get these little pieces cut in a setup that greatly reduces the risk of any sort of injury. There's plenty of ways to do this, but this is what I decided to do for this job. I start out by spraying Starbond Accelerator on one end of all the little wedge pieces. Then I put a small dab of medium thick CA on the other end of each piece and stick them all together to create one long wedge blank that's easier and safer to handle. And I like the medium flexible because it's stronger than the other CAs that tend to be more brittle. But this is a little runny for this application. So I'm making more of a mess than I would if I used the thick. But nevertheless, it takes just a few seconds to glue all the little chunks into one long strip for cutting. By repositioning the fence, I used the same setup for cutting these wedges to length as I did for cutting them off their blanks, with one exception. Because the strip of wedges is so thin and so flexible, I use a scrap of half inch plywood to hold that long strip into place as each wedge is cut off the end. And that setup makes quick, safe work of cutting up a handful of those wee wooden wedges. And that is the fit I get. Perfect. Now that it's time for glue up, I can tell you two things. And the first thing is I'm excited to be at this stage of the project. And the second thing is that I'm kind of anxious to be at this stage of the project. Uh, glue up is always a little bit stressful and a project nine months in the making is a little more stressful still. But here it is and it's showtime. So uh, one last prep step. I sanded everything with 500 grit wet and dry sandpaper. So it's super smooth because I'm putting a gel poly finish on it. If I was doing a lacquer or a varnish, sanding to 180 is plenty. But that takes just a few seconds and also requires that I blow the dust out of the pores of the wood before the next step. And I need the dust out of the pores because I use some green frog tape to protect surfaces of these pieces so glue cleanup after glue up is easier. 
and I apply this two inch wide frog tape to the inside surfaces of pieces near the finger joints because gluing finger joints is extra messy. I also apply tape around the handle mortises because it's inevitable that excess glue will run on these surfaces and I want to keep the effort required to clean up that excess glue to a minimum. I fold the ends of the tape over to make it easier to pull off during cleanup and you can see in this shot that I leave the tape about a sixteenth of an inch away from the inside corner on the joint. And just like that I almost forgot one thing and that is uh, I use the protective tape to cover up the engravings as well because I don't want any glue running down into that detail because it would be virtually impossible to get cleaned out. So if you're not doing engravings you don't have to worry about this step but if you are it's a good idea to add a little frog tape for insurance. And now it's back to the regularly scheduled glue up. I forgot to shoot video of it but I did a final dry fit of this tool tote uh, before applying this tape just to make sure everything is good. I've got these various parts numbered so they go back in uh, together exactly how I want them to. But you'll notice that I've only taped one end of these parts and that's because there's enough going on in a glue up like this as it is. So I use a divide and conquer method where I just glue up one end of the tool tote and I dry fit the other end. Once this end's all glued up and the glue is set, I can repeat the process and glue up the other end. So I know everything is going to fit how and where I want it to. Um, I also have a dry paper towel here for the process. I've got a, a cup and an acid brush. In the cup I've got the hydrogen oxide that helps keep the bristles of the brush soft while I'm doing this. Cleans them up in between the steps. Uh, tight bond 3 glue. Got the bottle laying on the side because it's getting close to empty. And I like an older bottle of glue because it's a little bit thicker and it doesn't run so bad on these joints. And I've got a sharpened putty knife there. This piece of plywood is the exact size of the bottom of the tool tote that helps square it up. I've got a rubber mallet for tapping things together and a plastic faced hammer mallet for driving the tenon wedges. So uh, I'm going to double check the camera before I head into this because once I start gluing this I can't stop. Uh, I do have the furnace shut off because I don't want any hot air blowing on here because I've got to um, butter up all the joints, the fingers here, 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 plus the end of the tenon, get all that done, slip together and clamps on it before the glue skins over. So it can be a little bit messy, but if anything goes sideways during, during the operation, I got to just keep going and I can't stop to deal with the camera. But now that I've done everything I can to make the glue up go smoothly, let's do this. Obviously, the main thing I'm doing here is working quickly and efficiently to distribute an even coat of glue over all the surfaces that touch when these pieces come together. I start by applying a generous amount of the Type Bond 3 glue to the surfaces and then I use the dampened brush to distribute the glue evenly over all the surfaces and keep running to a minimum. And this is what I'm looking for so far. Uh, those things are working out good. Now it's time for this tenon. I wish I could bring your, the camera around to show you this from a better angle, but that ain't happening today. Now that I've got all the glue applied on that end, I'll just dry fit this end. And that keeps everything in alignment there, so everything is trued up. And at this point, if you try to imagine what it would take to glue up that end as well, all at the same time, it gets a little bit crazy. I start by applying clamps here to pull the sides in tight and I already glued up one of these tool totes. It's back there somewhere just to kind of get everything in order so I know which clamps go where. A good sequence to use for everything and that's going to work. And these Irwin clamps are 24 inch clamps and when they say 24 inches they mean 24 inches to the extent that they're hard to fit on here because the lugs of the finger joint stick out past the end of the tool tote making it 24 and an eighth inches long. Well that's kind of annoying.
And all the while, I'm working with these clamps. The glue drying clock is ticking. But I am ahead of the game. Everything looks good. Everything is nice and snug like it needs to be. Got glue squeezing out where I want it and not where I don't want it. And I brought the camera around to this end so you can see what it looks like when I go to drive these wedges into place. Give a little fresh glue in those little slots there. And I apply glue to the pointy end of the little carry wood shims, wedges. Get everything in place and line that up. A little, just a little bit of glue on the wedges is all it takes. And once they're started, I just drive them in about the same amount until refusal, which means that the wedge is tight, the mortise is tight, and or the wedge is bottomed out in the slot. But once they're driven in sufficiently, I clean up a little of the excess glue so you can see what the fit looks like. And it should look just about like that when they're driven. And glue up of the first end of the tool tote went just about as good as could be expected. But I've got some cleanup to do. And everyone who's ever watched a next level carpentry video knows that I do not use water and rags to clean up glue squeeze out. But instead use finely powdered sawdust to soak up the extra glue that's squeezing out of these joints. It dries up the glue quickly, makes it easier to clean up. And most of all, doesn't dilute the glue and make it soak into the wood where it would produce an unsightly finish when it comes time to apply the gel poly varnish. Doesn't take much of that powdered sawdust to soak up the glue either. And I follow up by using a sharpened putty knife to remove the bulk of it, then remove the tape and clean up the little residual glue that's left behind. I don't really need to clean up glue on the outside of the tool tote because these surfaces all get sanded smooth with a belt sander later. But I take an initial pass on the end of the tenon to make the sanding process easier later. Glue cleanup is a little bit difficult as it is and even more difficult to capture in the camera. But I'll let the camera run to prove a point that this method of glue cleanup is simple, quick, and effective. Because the frog tape contains any excess glue squeeze out and a sharpened putty knife quickly removes whatever is left behind because the sawdust amalgamates that glue to keep it from running. Cleaning out the inside corners is just as easy, but it's still difficult to get a good camera angle so you can see what's going on. But I think you'll get the idea by now. And here's where tabs on the end of the frog tape make it easier to remove so that I can alternate scraping glue along the vertical grain on the end piece and the horizontal grain on the side pieces until all the glue squeeze out is gone and the joint is crisp and clean. And as I've been known to say at times like this, I'll buy that. And for any non-believers in the audience, I hope it's evident that this method of glue cleanup is much better, much easier, and much cleaner than all the fuss required before, during, and after using water and rags for cleaning up glue squeeze out. And that is what phase one of this tool tote glue up looks like. So I'm going to take a break while this dries for an hour or so when I can pull these clamps and glue up the other end. Except that I almost forgot one very important step of this glue up process. And that is to make sure that the tool tote is coming out square. And I've got this piece of plywood here cut to the right width. And just a little bit uh, less than the right length for this tool tote. And I've got it cut that way. So all I need to do to square everything up is to tap that piece into place and use a feather shim to rack it so it's perfectly square. Even though, as you can see by this little gap here, that this is very square already. But I'll still give it a little tweak to close that gap. And a feather shim driven into the gap on the opposite end of the tool tote quickly tightens the gap on the other end of the tool tote to ensure that the assembly will be perfectly square when the glue dries. I gave this stage one glue up a couple hours to dry, which is more than enough time for the glue to set up so I can remove the clamps and proceed with the second stage of the glue up for this tool tote. Oh, 
Or maybe I could just leave this as an open end tool tote for something completely different. Well, that ought to do it for this second stage of the glue up. You can kind of see that's a little bit frenetic, but with everything in place, it goes good enough. And I'm absolutely pleased with the way this glue up has gone. And you can take a break while I pull off the tape, clean up the glue, and put that bottom piece in for squaring up the glue up so that it dries square like it needs to. And I'll pick it up again after the glue is dried and I can pull these clamps off for good. In light of the fact that there's videos on YouTube about 15 minutes long that show someone building an entire house, I want to congratulate both of you viewers that are still watching this video in the neighborhood of three hours long for building a Miro tool tote because that tells me you're the sort of viewers that understand there's a lot more to a project like this than what you'll see on HGTV. So here I am removing the clamps after the glue dried on this tool tote overnight. So now you can see what it takes to do the final sanding on the outside of this tool tote. I freely admit that I complicated the build by adding an accent stripe that's exactly three fingers wide on that finger joint. And now I have to admit that I complicated the sanding process because I engraved these sides because I need to be able to sand the joinery smooth without digging into any of that engraving. So I've got this set up here so I can do that successfully. And what you see is just a piece of half inch material that I've clamped down firmly to the work surface so that I can firmly clamp a tool tote to that and keep it nice, level and secure at a good working height like this. Because there's delicate end grain involved with these finger joints, I'm not using a flush trim router bit to even up the lugs here, but I'm gonna use my trusty three by 21 Porter cable belt sander to even up all these lugs that I ran long on purpose. And I need to use a couple protective measures to keep from spoiling the piece. The first thing is making sure the piece is secure and at a good working height. And the next thing is to put a sanding shield over the engraved lettering here. And I'm just using a thin piece of tough plastic and spec tape for this. And I stick it to the surface of the side so that it just covers the end of the Y in next level carpentry. Next, I use a soft lead pencil to put guide marks on the side piece and in between the lugs of the finger joint. And those marks will help guide the sanding process so I can see where I focus sanding pressure. I'm using a sharp 120 grit belt on the belt sander which makes quick work of flushing up the ends of the Russian birch plywood where they stick through the tool tote side. I use firm even pressure and a steady hand to balance the belt sander and take multiple intentional cuts until the lugs are flush with the side. Then I reposition the tool tote and repeat the process on the other end of the side. And if you want a bit of insight into the method and techniques I'm using, check out the video linked on your screen. It shows another video I did demonstrating these very same pro tips for better belt sanding. And now I can reset the setup and flush up the joinery on the ends of this tool tote. Flushing up joinery on the ends is the same thing, only different. I start by clamping the squaring block to the work surface because it holds the tool tote firmly and securely at a perfect working height. And with the tool tote firmly in place, I use the same sanding shield and pencil marks to guide the sanding process of flushing up the carry wood lugs with the Russian birch plywood end with the main difference here being the added difficulty of sanding down those hardwood lugs without sanding through the thin birch veneer on the plywood end. But with this setup, it's entirely doable. And I know the job is done when all the lugs are flush, but pencil marks between and alongside the lugs are gone, but the sanding shield and long pencil mark 
are intact. And naturally, I repeat the process on the other side of the tool coat end. Flushing up the wedged tenon on the end of the handle is the same thing, only different. With the workpiece secure, I carefully use a multi-tool to trim away the bulk of the protruding wedged tenon before marking the perimeter with that pencil and using the belt sander to sand the tenon and wedges perfectly flush with the tool coat end. And flush trimming that wedged tenon is just as quick and simple as that. Once all the joinery is sanded flush with a belt sander, I switch back to random orbit sanding mode like Chip did earlier and go through the grits on the outside of the tool tote until it's super smooth and ready for that gel poly finish. You saw me start with an oopsie eraser to remove remaining pencil marks left behind during the belt sanding process. And while using the random orbit sander, I focus on keeping the sander flat as I can to the work because any tipping could gouge the surface and compromise the crisp but shallow engraving of my signature in the soft Russian birch plywood. The best part is that with the workpiece held securely, it doesn't take long to get through the random orbit grits, followed by sanding with 320 grit by hand, and the final step of hand sanding with that 500 grit sandpaper to give the entire surface an unbelievably smooth finish as preparation for applying the gel poly later. That's smooth. And it goes without saying that I go through the same series of steps sanding the sides of the tool coats that I did on the ends until they're all cleaned up, buttery smooth, and ready for a gel poly finish. And there you have it, a very nicely sanded next level carpentry tool corral. To convert this from a tool corral to a tool tote, I'll add a bottom to it to address the question about that missing piece that's probably been nagging you for about three hours since the beginning of this video. I expect my answer to this question is going to be as unexpected as it is delayed. And so to cut off the trolls in mid stride before they tear into me on this, I want to remind everybody that this is a master carpenter's tool tote that I expect to work hard on the job site. And I don't want it to be any more of a poser than I am. And a plywood bottom that's held in with screws is my solution for that. If anyone's making a tool tote for a showpiece, then by all means, make a raised panel bottom that fits into a dado in the sides of the bottom of the tool tote and gets glued in place during previous assembly and glue up steps. But for my design and my purposes, a bottom piece that fits into a rabbit and is held in place by screws has served me well for close to 20 years on that tool tote. And the main reason is because a tool tote like this that's out on a job site needs a facelift every few years. And if I can't take the bottom out to do that, I'm less likely to do that facelift. And if you consider spilling a quart of paint in here or anything else, like water damage if the tool tote gets stuck out in the rain, etc., it'd be really difficult to clean up the inside of the tool tote and apply another coat of gel poly if the bottom is secured in place. But by taking the bottom out, I can restore the tool tote to like new condition after a few years of heavy job site use. And so if this revelation doesn't shake you loose and cause you to head out in disappointment and disgust, stick with me and I'll show you the simple process I use for installing a removable bottom in these tool totes. The first step in the process is to create a rabbit around the whole inside of the bottom of the tool tote to accept a piece of half inch Russian birch plywood that will make up the bottom piece. And I do that with an inch and three eighths diameter adjustable cut rabbiting bit in the Powerlift Pro. And there's a technical issue here with the setup in that I want the depth of the rabbit to be slightly less than the half inch thickness of this piece so that the bottom panel isn't flush with the bottom of the tool toed sides, but sticks down about a sixteenth of an inch. And that's another benefit of doing the tool tote bottom this way, because when the tool tote gets slid across things that would chip the edge or chip the veneers on the end, the bottom panel, which is removable and replaceable, takes all the wear and the damage and the screws that hold it in allow me to switch it out if necessary. So I set the height of this router bit accordingly and I'll give you a close up. And a couple other things about this setup that are worth noting is that I'm using a starter pin so that I can ease into the cut and not tear up anything on the tool tote that I've worked so hard to make. And the other thing I do is make the rabbit in two passes. Like I said, this is an adjustable cut rabbiting bit. And I start out with a large bearing that limits the cut to about an eighth of an inch for the first pass on the rabbit because it's less likely to chip. And then I switch to a smaller diameter bearing 
for the full final depth of the rabbit. And waiting till near the end of the video like this allows me to place that rabbit nice and clean around the inside edge. I don't have to worry about stopped rabbits so they don't come out the ends of the tool tote, etc. And the fact that I'm using this large diameter router bit actually creates rounded corners on the tool tote bottom, which is just one more plus in the design, function, and practicality of this Master Carpenter's tool tote. And you can see the bit height setting in this ultra close up shot where it's just a little lower than the thickness of the plywood. And you can also see where the starting pin is located in relation to this large diameter rabbiting bit. This is a tricky sequence to get on camera, but notice that I start with the tool tote up against the starting pin and then ease the tool tote into the spinning bit. Also notice I'm wearing Smurf gloves to maintain control of the tool tote while I route this rabbit in a climb cutting direction. I use climb cutting for making this rabbit because it minimizes the amount of tear out I'd get routing in the normal feed direction, especially on the vertical grain of the half inch Russian birch plywood on the ends. And using the climb cutting technique, I steadily but carefully make a first pass for this rabbit all around the inside perimeter of the tool tote. Once I've completed the first lap around the tool tote, I brush away the bulk of the shavings and make a second pass with firm steady pressure down on the tool tote to make sure the whole rabbit is the same height and depth all the way around. And there's enough racket and chips, even with a shallow setting on the router bit with that larger bearing. But using the climb cutting technique, I've got a nice clean rabbit all the way around. And after the first pass, you can see that the rabbit is nice and clean, although it's shallow and the radius doesn't even trim out the whole square corner where the side and the end come together. But that'll all change with the second pass. That carry wood is tough cutting, but after completing the first step of the rabbit on the other two tool totes, I sweep away a mound of shavings and switch to the smaller diameter guide bearing for the second stage of routing the rabbit. And then, like so many other steps in this build, it's second verse, same as the first, as I use the same technique for cutting the rabbit to full depth on the bottom edges of the tool tote. Now that the noise has stopped and the dust and chips are settled, you can see what the finished rabbit looks like at its full depth around the entire interior perimeter of the bottom of the tool tote. With all the rabbiting complete, I can set about fitting a piece of this half inch Russian birch plywood to the recess in the bottom of the tool totes by cutting the piece to length and ripping it to width for a snug but not forced fit. These bottoms need to be 23 and a half strong long by exactly 11 and a half inches wide, but that's bound to vary from build to build, which is why I wait until now to get the exact measurement instead of cutting the piece ahead of time. After checking pieces to make sure they're perfectly square, I cut them to that size of 23 and a half strong by 11 and a half with a sharp crosscut blade and a table saw. Then I double check the pieces for fit in the bottom of the actual tool tote to make sure they're sized for a good fit. And that will be marvelous. So now I can round the corners off so they fit the same radius made by the rabbiting bit in the previous step. If you remember, the rabbiting bit has an outside diameter of an inch and three eighths. So I put an 11 16 inch radius on the corner of this scrap of plywood that I'll use as a flush trimming guide for trimming the corners of the bottom. First, I use the flush trimming guide as a pattern to draw a small 90 degree arc on each corner of the tool tote bottom. Then I go to the miter saw and trim close to that line with a 45 degree angle cut to make flush trimming easier. And I finish up fabrication of the bottom by using a half inch diameter top bearing flush trim bit and my Bosch coat router that rides on that simple flush trimming template to quickly put a perfect 11 16 inch radius on all four corners of the tool tote bottom piece. And just like that, I put four perfectly rounded corners on the bottom panel. And that process and sequence gives me a perfect fit of the bottom panel in the rabbited recess in the bottom of this tool tote. And there's just a slight reveal of the bottom panel next to the sides of the tool tote to keep those sides from chipping during use. Once bottoms are fit into each of the three tool totes, I just pop the panel out, flip them over, and use an eighth inch round over bit and a Bosch Colt router to ease the bottom edges of all three panels to minimize chipping when the tool tote is slid across rough surfaces during use. And while I've got that eighth inch bit chucked up in the router, I use the four vertical corners of the finger joints on the outside of the tool tote the same way and for the same purpose. Next, I use a double square to 
put marks three inches away from each corner on all four faces of the tool totes and then add a mark at 12 inches on the center of each side. And these marks are locations for the 10 screws that hold the bottom in place. After making all the location marks, I reset the double square to a quarter inch and add a second mark at each location for the height of the screws off the bottom. Next, I slip the bottom panel back into place and hold it there with a couple of squeeze clamps while I use an eighth inch snappy bit to pilot and countersink holes for the number six by one inch oval head stainless steel screws I use for holding the bottom into place. And I'm careful with these steps to make sure I don't over countersink or overdrive these screws, leaving the oval top heads just proud of the surface. And now, with that step complete, I'll remove those 10 screws and slip the bottom back out so I can take care of the finishing touches of edging and sanding in final preparation for applying that gel poly finish I've been talking about for a veritable eternity. Two small but important details that I haven't covered are using a 1 16th inch roundover bit to ease the bottom edges of all four sides of the tool tote and then hand sanding the thumbnail profile edges on the sides and on the ends, starting with 120 grit and finishing up with 500 grit, like all the rest of the surfaces. Beyond that, final prep amounts to cleaning up any remaining pencil marks and verifying that I've gone through all the grit stages on every surface on all the pieces, because when that's complete, I'm ready for that gel poly finish, finally. I've been rightly accused many times of bearing the lead in next level carpentry video productions over the years, and this may well be the most egregious instance of that to date, but after a long afternoon of detail sanding on these three tool totes to get everything sanded to 500 grit, here we are, and it's time to apply that gel poly finish. And the main reason I choose gel poly for the finish on these tool totes out of nearly an infinite variety of other finishes and application methods out there in the world is for the way it makes the wood look and feel. On other projects like my Master Carpenter's footstools, I spray applied a water-based polyurethane varnish, which is probably more durable than this gel poly, but for tools that I use and carry with my hands, there's just nothing like the feel of wood sanded to 500 grit with a couple coats of gel poly on it. The other thing about gel poly compared to spray finishes is that the finish goes into the wood and doesn't chip like spray applied finishes. So for these tool totes that get banged around, that get used, I don't want the finish to chip off because it not only looks bad, it's just harder to repair and refinish. Whereas the gel poly, any damage that happens to the tool tote, I can clean up and repair simply by sanding and reapplying. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But I also realize that I need to get to it to keep the last two viewers of this video from leaving. Besides being a finish that looks amazing and feels great, this Old Masters Gel Poly is about as foolproof of a finish as you can get. I just use a scrap of a soft cotton cloth, dipped into the Gel Poly, and then just smear it on. And that's all there is to it. And on a project like this with sharp, intricate corners and detail, along with this laser engraved text, getting a smooth, even consistent finish is a no-brainer. You can't put too much on, and there's really no such thing as a run. It's just a matter of putting the finish on and letting it soak into the wood. And the wood itself pretty much dictates how much of the finish that I put on because I just keep applying it till it quits soaking in. And that definitely varies from project to project and from one wood species to the other. But the application process is exactly the same. And I don't know about you, but I just love the way this finish makes the beautiful walnut and maple of this tool tote come to life with deep, rich tones and luster. And the finishing process looks a little bit different here because I'm shooting video. Normally I'd start on the inside of the tool tote 
and work my way out until a bunch of the surface is covered. Uh, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself with this finish, uh, not because it'll spoil it, it just makes it more difficult to work. When it starts to tack up and the finish starts to set, getting soaked in like it's doing here, uh, when you get into corners and stuff, it's a little harder to manage. But the beauty of it is, as long as the finish is still wet, all you need to do is go back over it with another coat and it wakes it right back up so you're not losing anything if your timing's off or you get the sequence a little bit messed up. But I wanted to do the handle here while you're watching because it's an example of just how great this works. As long as all these surfaces are sanded to that 500 grit ahead of time. If you, and if you miss a spot, like I said, this finish is pretty much foolproof. If I went through here and I thought, oh, this handle only got sanded to 150, it's no big deal at all. I could just let the finish uh, dry overnight, come back and just sand right through it, right over it. Uh, coating, recoating doesn't really matter. And if there's any glue spots in corners or whatever, anything gets missed, um, the finish won't take over glue. You'll, you'll see the difference. I don't know if there's any on this project or not right now, but if I ended up with a glue smudge over here, it's the same difference. I can just take a razor blade, scrape away that uh, glue fingerprint or whatever it is, re-sand it through the grits if necessary, finishing at 500 grit, and then just slather on the gel poly, and no one's any the wiser when it's all said and done. Just a really, really nice thing. It does provide a good deal of weather resistance, water resistance. Uh, I've had my toolboxes get caught out in the rain, and that one up there has been out, rained on and snowed on and everything else. And, you know, it's, it's not like um, a polyurethane, spar polyurethane finish. I mean, it, it could water stain if you, if you make a mess out of it, but with just nominal, normal care and attention to it, it's, it's a very durable finish. So I've spent a short 10 minutes applying uh, varnish to this side piece here and the handle. And I can tell it's starting to tack up. Like the wood is getting saturated with the varnish, which is the whole idea. There's less goop uh, smearing around on the surface. It's coming down to the wood itself. So it's time to buff off uh, the varnish, which I will ultimately do with another piece of that soft cotton cloth, but because I've got this engraved text signature and these little holes, I take an intermediate step here in buffing off the varnish, which is to use uh, compressed air to kind of uh, bring the varnish out of that, uh, those recesses. So I just start with an initial wipe with a paper towel to kind of get everything off the surface. And I use that compressed air to blow it out of those holes. and out of the engraved uh, depressions there. So that works really nice. Uh, you probably can't see it in that camera angle, but it does force any of the gel poly that's kind of pooled in those recesses out to the surface. And then I just buff off the whole surface just with a clean cotton cloth. And that's what the application of the first coat of gel poly looks like. This is just unbelievably smooth. You'll have to take my word for it. And it only gets better from there. If I let this set overnight till this dries, I can scuff this down with some 500 grit sandpaper and just give it another coat in the same process. And it just keeps getting better and better. But what I'm left with is a satin sheen that's easy on the eyes and soft to the touch, which in my mind is a perfect next level finish for a next level carpentry tool toad. And there it is, 
I suppose I've spent a long 15 minutes on this varnishing process, uh, finishing up there by blowing varnish out of the engraving and some of the nicks and crannies in the corners. But other than that, all I need to do is kind of give everything a once over with the soft cotton cloth. And ironically, once the finish is all wiped off, it's done. And that's because the finish is soaking into the wood, not laying on the wood. And that, as they say, is that. And I know when to stop when the cloth slides smoothly across the surface. You can feel if there's any gummed up varnish anywhere. But I've got plenty of time uh, to do that cleanup. And even at this stage, if I found a sticky spot somewhere, I can always just use that cloth over there with the gel poly on it, give it a once over, it wakes that finish back up so that it can soak in more and also wipe off smoothly like that. And because this is as boring as watching paint dry because it's watching paint dry, I'll shut off the camera while I put gel poly on the bottom panel and come back for a final segment and show you what the finished finish looks like. Well, what do you think, Chip? Are you as glad to finish your tool tote as I am to finish mine? Absolutely. but. Probably not half as glad as both of our remaining viewers are after watching a video three and a half hours long. Yeah, no kidding. And thank goodness for the miracle of video editing or this production would be 10 times as long. True that. And I guess that means we should ditch our dreams of becoming tool toe titans on TikTok, right? Yeah, without a doubt. But it does make me really appreciate viewers who come to Next Level Carpentry to watch and learn rather than just show up expecting to be taught. And so to them, I say, as always, and until next time, thanks for watching. And I'll second that. Thanks for watching. Yeah, I guess it's time to give this guy a test drive on a job site. Well, well, well. I've got to say, if you're still here and still watching after over three hours of video showing how to build a master carpenter's tool tote. You're very persistent and very determined. And with those attributes, I'm guessing that you're also curious and observant. And to reward you for all those traits, I wanted to include this segment at the end of the end of the end, because the observant among you will notice that on the Kerrywood master carpenter's tool tote, if you look close, being observant, you notice that the lettering isn't burned black from a laser, but it's highlighted with a metallic red. And I'm going to show you how to add that special next level accent to a next level tool tote for those who are willing to stay to the end of the end of the end. And I get that done with a couple products that I'll introduce you to here. And the first is some epoxy. This is from Starbond. And again, this is a beta testing product. I'm not sure where this product will end up in their epoxy lineup, but they're working to increase the UV resistant qualities of epoxies. And what I have here is a 75 minute epoxy. And the real treat here is this product that Starbonds had for quite a while. And these are mica powders. And I'm using a deep red called Ruby Red in this selection. And I've not done a lot with these powders, but I did some experimenting off camera and came up with a process for infilling the recess on lettering created by a laser with epoxy and mica powders to add a special touch to this special tool tote, which is going to be my personal daily on the job tool tote. So I'm devoting a little extra time to making this one extra special. So here goes. The first step is to clean out any loose ash and soot from the bottom of the engraving left behind by the laser beam. And I do that by gently scrubbing each line of each letter with a brass bristle brush. And I follow up with a puff of compressed air to make sure any and all loose material is gone. 
And it might not show in the camera, but I can see that the color of the engraving is lightening because dark blue soot is being removed from wood fibers. So although it's subtle, this does make a beneficial change to improve the process overall. The next step is simple enough. I just reset the surface of the engraved text with 320 grit sandpaper to remove any loose particles, rough edges, or soot that might have smeared out onto the face of this light colored maple. And naturally, I follow up with another blast of compressed air. Sealing the surface is the next step that's simple but very important. And I'm using a method here that I've not seen anywhere else on YouTube or otherwise. I start by using frog tape to mask off the carry wood next to the maple banner because I don't want the red epoxy getting into unwanted places. The whole purpose of this step is to keep that slow drying epoxy from wicking out into the wood and blurring the edges of otherwise crisp text. And as I said, the method I'm using here, as far as I know, is unique on YouTube because I see other people using epoxy that cures overnight or sanding sealer, multiple coats, etc., to accomplish the same purpose. But I did a little experimenting and found that I can use Starbond's water thin CA glue to do a better job of sealing the wood. And as an added bonus, it takes only minutes instead of hours. So after masking off the rough perimeter, I have Starbond Accelerator and Starbond Water Thin CA Glue, plus just a generic disposable acid brush to do the job. As you may not know, the Water Thin CA Glue sets incredibly fast. So for this application, I'm not applying Accelerator first because I want time to distribute the thin CA across the lettering before I add the accelerator to cure it. The benefit of using this water thin CA over epoxy is that it doesn't infill any of the slight depression of the lettering created by the laser. So there's more room for the mica powder and epoxy to fill the lettering for a crisp, clean, bright accent. Plus the fact that it's CA glue allows it to cure quickly after penetrating the wood to create the desired sealing effect, which is the whole reason for using it in the first place. And make sure to use plenty of ventilation during this step because the off-gassing of the CA glue and accelerator is almost strong enough to smell through the lens of the camera. Once I'm done applying a thorough wet coat of the water thin CA glue to all the lettering, I let it soak in for a minute to penetrate the wood and then give the whole banner text logo a spritz of accelerator to permanently set the sealer. And as you've seen, after just a couple of minutes, this next level carpentry laser etched text is sealed completely and the sealer is completely dry. Next, I mix equal predetermined amounts of parts A and B of the 75 minute Starbond epoxy into a couple disposable plastic spoons and mix that together with a predetermined amount of the ruby red mica powder in a small disposable cup with a popsicle stick until the mixture is smooth and consistent and the mica powder is distributed equally in the mixed epoxy. And I work to keep these amounts equal and consistent so that the color density comes out consistent on the engravings on all four sides of the tool tote. And I should note that I'm using 75 minute epoxy here, not five or 10 minute epoxy, because I want plenty of open working time to get a smooth, consistent application of the mixture in the lettering. With all the preparation steps complete, it's show time. So I dab the epoxy mixture onto the lettering and trowel it smooth with this amazing rosewood handled flexible putty knife from my friend Brent that quickly and smoothly presses the mica powdered epoxy down into the indentation of the lasered lettering. And as you can see, at this stage, the frog tape confines the epoxy to the area of the lettering that'll make cleanup and sanding easier later. I use firm, steady pressure and a very low angle on this flexible putty knife so that pressure forces epoxy completely down into the recess of the lettering and actually leaves the epoxy a bit proud of the lettering itself, which you can see reflected by lights in the shop. And this is exactly what the application should look like at this stage. I admit to being more than a little nervous with this process. I've only done this a few times and I'm risking the well-being of this entire tool tote if I mess something up. But I'm feeling really good about the way this, this went. I'll be able to repeat the proportions of epoxy and mica powder to get a consistent mix of that material for the lettering on the other side and both ends. And I'll point out quickly here before I go to cleaning up that the thickness of the masking tape actually acts like a screed by driving, uh, dragging the putty knife across there. The knife is wide enough to span it and that leaves just a little bit of a film of epoxy proud of the wood so that I'm sure the letters are full when I peel the tape and clean up the epoxy. So I've got to do the dishes here and I'll come back to this after it sets overnight to make sure it's good and dry 
and show you another pro tip for epoxy filling laser lettering that you're not going to see anywhere else on YouTube. So hang out just a little bit longer and I'll show you that. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. There's one last step where I go over the lettering with a small flame while the epoxy is still wet. Tree lease air bubbles trap down in the mixture for mixing the epoxy and applying it into the lettering. And I doubt it shows up in the camera, but with the proper reflection, I can see thousands of little air bubbles rising to the surface and popping as the flame passes over the wet epoxy. I feel better about this epoxy after letting it dry overnight, even though it's 75 minute epoxy. I think the cure time is extended because of the concentration of mica powder slows down the cross-linking of the epoxy itself. But now that it's set up overnight, I'll finish up with this. And what you saw using the thin CA glue for sealing is the first pro tip for epoxy filling laser engravings. But to me, the next pro tip I'm going to show you is even more significant. So watch and learn. While I clamp the tool tote at a good working height like I did before during the belt sanding phase. And peel off the frog tape to fully expose the epoxy filled lettering on the tool tote banner strip. And you'll see that this simple tool is my secret weapon for cleaning up the epoxy on this because every other epoxy filling video I've seen on YouTube resorts to sandpaper at this stage to flush up the epoxy with the wood and remove all the excess. And as I've already said numerous times in this video, I hate sanding, which is why I choose this tool. But this tool also really improves the epoxy removal process because all it does is remove epoxy. It doesn't remove wood. If you start out with 80 grit sandpaper on a random orbit sander, you're bound to remove excess wood on the perimeter of the engraving before you ever get down to the wood over the engraving itself. And I'll link this tool in the video description, but basically it's a Warner carbide scraper and it has a solid carbide blade in it that's interchangeable for sides. And I make sure when I'm doing this epoxy work that I use a brand new edge because I want a nice clean scrape as I go about this. So let me bring you in close and show you what I mean. And here's a close up of the tool itself. It's just got a die cast aluminum handle. It's got a good knob on here for control. And the interchangeable carbide blade has a nice clean sharp edge on it. I'm not going to rub my finger on there because it'll cut it because it's Ginsu sharp to make it effective for this sort of thing. And when I use the scraper, I put firm even pressure on it to start peeling away, scraping away uh, the layer of epoxy on top, which varies in thickness from one end to the other. But that's no big deal. And notice as I'm scraping, I change up the angle of attack as I scrape because I don't want to create speed bumps that the scraper rides over. And you can see the epoxy shavings as I continue to scrape down through the thick layer that's on top of the engravings here. And I try to even out the layer as I go. You can see here I'm starting to get through down into the wood where on the ends it's still thick. So I take extra passes there to even up the layer as I work down towards the wood itself. And here I switch both the camera angle and the direction I'm scraping to remove extra thickness over the word next in the engraving. And keep in mind that as I get down to the wood itself, I'm removing that thin layer of CA glue that acted as sealer to prevent bleeding of the epoxy into the maple around the lettering. And after removing the bulk of the epoxy and CA from the logo stripe, I switch to a sharpened putty knife and scrape at a diagonal across the entire banner to finish the cleanup and smooth the surface. After carefully scraping with the sharpened putty knife, I follow up by block sanding with 320 grit sandpaper and hand sanding with the 500 grit so that the surface of the lettering and the maple banner strip are super smooth. Then add icing to the cake with an initial coat of gel poly where you can see the lettering is crisp and clean against the maple background and has a subtle but distinct deep red hue from the ruby mica powder that complements a similar deep red hue of the carry wood on the tool tote sides. The mica powder is a bit more visible when I supplement poor shop lighting with a flashlight, but I'm 100% pleased with the results. Of course, I could have doubled the dose of mica powder in the same quantity of epoxy to make this pop a little bit more, but this is just the sort of situation where often less is more, and I have no regrets for the results I got here. And I hope the takeaway for you end of the end of the end viewers is how fast and effective that thin CA glue works as a sealer to keep the epoxy from bleeding. Because despite 
anything anyone can say about the subtle color of that epoxy with mica powder. There's no question about the effectiveness of the thin CA as a sealer for preventing epoxy bleed. And so I hope you think that this little demonstration justifies the extra time you spent watching this video to the end of the end of the end. So I can let you go while I repeat the sealing and infill process on the other three engravings on this tool tote and catch up with both of you next time at the end of 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 a video here at Next Level Carpentry. With just nominal, normal care and attention to it, it's, it's a very durable finish. It does have an amber tone to it, even though, um, and even though I'm using Good grief. I can't believe that just happened. But I suppose it's par for the course and makes me thankful that I'm actually wearing an apron because I really do that. And I just saved one of my next level carpentry t-shirts from disaster. But if there was ever prize content for a blooper reel, <laughs> that would be tough to beat.